perspective who brings a special energy and dedication to this work. His considerable experience will certainly add an immediate understanding of the challenges faced in emergency management. The two members of our immediate Cipriani family, Mr. Horn and Mr. Baldeo Singh, I thank you for your commitment to teaching and your willingness to give your time. And I want to pause here to offer deep and heartfelt condolences to Colin, who only last night lost his father. Um, our prayers, our thoughts, our support is with Colin and our family, and we want to convey our condolences to them. As I sit in my office here at the college this morning, and as the rain pours, the immediacy of the threats are high in my consciousness. Two years ago, CCLCS was inundated by floodwaters and recovery came at a steep cost that we could hardly afford at the time. We live with risk, but it is up to us to anticipate, anticipate, plan and manage risk in order to mitigate their impact. I welcome you all here this morning and I am sure that our participants will benefit immensely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. This morning, as we dive into the program of the day, our first speaker is no stranger to the field of emergency management. Captain Neville Wint is multi-skilled in emergency and crisis management, a professional with a wealth of experience and competencies in project coordination and management, inventory and logistics management, business continuity and administration. He has over 20 years of interdisciplinary risk management in emergency operations, management, exercise and evaluation, disaster response operation in complex and dynamic situations. This experience includes supporting the Trinidad and Tobago state, local, and the private sector organizations in their planning for, responding to, and recovery from hazard impacts with research, policy, plans, and development, business continuity, and strategy for resilience. Captain Wind holds a master's in crisis, risk management, and disaster management from the University of Leicester and FEMA qualifications including Homeland Security and evaluation programs, incident command and train the trainers. He's a former member of the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force and a serving member of the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force Reserves. He has been a member of many high level public initiatives and facilitates courses in shelter management, initial and detailed damage assessment and emergency operations management. The, at the UWE Arthur Lodjack School of Global Business, he does enterprise risk management, business continuity, and emergency management modules. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, I would like to welcome Captain Neville Wint. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Paul, and please, at your earliest convenient, as you read that, by introduce me to the person you spoke about. Uh, Dr. Paul, distinguished panel, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this global space. Uh, it is indeed my pleasure to open this webinar, which I believe is the first. And uh, Dr. Paul, thank you for now allowing me to be uh, other first time as the college as my alumni, because I was one of your first students in this faculty in emergency management and security management. So it's again, indeed, my honor to present. And I will go on the foundation of having a discussion with you, ladies and gentlemen, as we look at the issues in the identification, preparedness, prevention of disasters in the Caribbean. And in to so do, we need to have an all of government and community framework, which is critical to ensuring that the 
those issues that affect not only Trinidad and Tobago, but the region, the CARICOM region, is established through that framework. This framework must comprise the following, what I consider pillar components, prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And these pillars must be tied together in a ring beam constructed with continuity of operations, continuity of governance, and most important, enterprise risk management. Having those pillars and that ring beam allows us to build a proper structure in which disaster risk management can be had across the region and in more particular to Trinidad and Tobago. Natural and man-made disasters, ladies and gentlemen, will continue to cause debt and infrastructure destruction across the globe. Um, we don't need to look too far back. Within this month, we have experienced flooding incidents from China to Germany to New York City, all demonstrating our vulnerability to climate change, as Dr. Henry announced that last two years, the impact of the, the college, which basically would have that cascading effect on the staff, its inability to continue business, so that brings into light business continuity and the whole issue of the enterprise management of, this, of, of the college. So our vulnerability to climate change will also impact our preparedness planning and preparedness planning feeds into the national emergency preparedness and disaster risk management strategies, which again deals with the whole issue of all of government approach. So government agencies, communities and business continue to, in my humble view, to fall short in the all hazard planning and preparedness. And when I say all hazard is, is that lack to identify all the hazards to which we are vulnerable to and therefore, how do we prepare and plan for it? This lack of preparation creates potential for serious implication, putting all sectors and people at risk. And I see all sectors based on the domino effect and the cascading effects of hazard impacts. And we could all understand the issue of flooding affects food security, it affects public health, it affects revenue earning. So we have to look at all sectors that we consider the, the impact and the implication of identifying others, being prepared and preventing and mitigating these things. Lack of preparation creates the potential for serious emergencies and these emergencies may have a slow or sudden onset. And these slow onset or sudden emergency initiators, for example, of sudden onset, we're talking about accidents resulting from natural or technological and even man-made and in recent times, we are seeing a combination of these incidents that can cause severe damage and loss to life property, thereby reducing national development and even be a factor to complex emergencies. And we need to understand that our lack of preparedness, therefore, brings into play movement of funds that will help development into recovery efforts. Experience have demonstrated key components to me that is required, and these are not all the components, but to me I identify these three components, the effective emergency and disaster service management planning. Those three components to me are one, clear communication. It is essential that the public gets the correct information from the correct experts in forums such as this, instead of the wrong information from the wrong person and from the wrong place. During and after disasters, everyone needs to be informed on all the hazards that impact them, how to respond, and what is the present situation. This information needs to be true, and in the light of social media and that fast pace, media practitioners, while struggling to be first, they need to be right. And in being right, they inform the public. So to effectively manage an emergency, persons must be on the same page and effective communication would be the ink that really could really write that script. Persons, secondly, persons need to be in form of the hazards and that hazard awareness is critical. People panic, ladies and gentlemen, when, when they are not prepared. Panic places a burden on government agencies and 
first responders who are providing aid and dealing also with the impact of that particular hazard. Individuals, neighbors, workers, your ladies and gentlemen are the first responder. You are there before the official first responder arrive. It is imperative that all take stock of the hazards, the accessibility, to understand your capabilities, understand the gaps within your capabilities and the limitation ahead of you in dealing with the hazards to which you are exposed. And your exposure can be direct and indirect based on where you are located. Thirdly, most and most important, we are dealing with the issues of comprehensive training. Your community, your place of work may not face or have not faced uh, emergency situation for years. Where there is no sub, there is no substitute for that real thing, but training is vital to ensure that everyone is prepared as possible. Training allows persons to sweat, as we say in military, sweat in peace, so you bleed less in war. And the more you train, the more you exercise, it becomes um, efficient. And therefore, there's a saying that you rise to the occasion. And as I lecture and I speak to people, uh, you don't rise to the occasion. You respond to your training. And your training allows you to pick in certain things. So training is critical. And another very important factor to consider when planning, implementing emergency preparedness, training for communities, and involvement of all stakeholders. So therefore, comprehensive training, ladies and gentlemen, is at also that within that ring beam to ensure that we have that level of preparedness. It can be easily assumed that one will have the full cooperation of ambulance service, police, the fire service. But these agencies often, ladies and gentlemen, have other responsibilities in the event of any disaster impact. So establishing their roles and understanding their roles during your training is essential to disaster reduction, emergency management, preparedness, and response. With all of that, leadership and leadership at all levels play a very important role. Occasionally, uh, disaster preparedness is seen as a secondary pursuit less impactful than the demands of your day-to-day -day events. However, the ability of your community, your business, and the safety of your family and co-workers is critical. And therefore, leadership is the responsibility of those who have been bestowed those leadership and those who can find themselves in that leadership position all because of a disaster. So community and business leaders, I appeal to you that you must understand the importance of strong emergency management, disaster reduction programs, and devote the proper resources towards that. When I say that, I'm talking about preparedness, identifying issues. Your knowledge, skills, capabilities in the developing, encompassing both government and professional in the response Recovery, preparedness is key to the national preparedness. We as a society, are, we are prepared and we will be prepared as much as we can cope with the incident. Japan earthquake demonstrated that while the society was able to cope and have been prepared for earthquake, the domino effects they were not prepared. And two years later, they also got the shocking reality that they were not prepared for flooding. So therefore, we are as prepared individually and agencies as the event would allow us to cope. Our all hazard preparedness and response are based on song analysis of the disaster risk and good linkages to early warning systems and include such activities as contingency and family planning, the whole issues of stockpiling of equipment and supplies, the development and arrangement of coordination, and even within the region, uh, led by CDEMA, which is the gold standard and have been duplicated and it's been tried to be duplicated by many jurisdictions, we have what is called the gold standard of coordination among member states. 
to reduce the issue of public, public evacuation. These issues form part of the all hazard development as we look to prepare. Critical also in these economic times, it is most important that formal institution, legal framework and budgetary capacity be also at the forefront to allow these things to happen. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. It has to be supported by institutional reform. It has to be um, supported by a legal framework and therefore the instruments. And I will congratulate the government of Trinidad and Tobago for adopting an all hazard approach when cabinet approved the Sendai framework of for disaster reduction 2015 to 2013, which basically by its four priority areas, provide all of society, every single individual, every single organization with, on, with the ability now to take it upon yourself through that approval. And those four priorities, this really speaks to how we understand disaster risk, issues. That's number one priority. The second priority is strengthening the disaster risk reduction to manage disaster. The issue of investing in the disaster risk reduction and resilience and enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response and build back better in the recovery, rehabilitation and construction. So therefore, the Sendai framework provides to all of us that ability to have that all of government approach and all of community approach in dealing with disaster risk management. And therefore, the issues of mitigation, preparedness, and response action must be executed in the context of disaster risk reduction and management. Continuity of governance, because every hazard impact has, an, has an, a, a direct implication how we govern the whole issue of enterprise risk management that's going to the business side and all aimed at building capacity needed to efficiently manage all types of disasters and achieve orderly transition from the response to sustain recovery and the issue of mitigation. So in closing, as we look at the whole issue of identification, preparation, and prevention of disasters, not only in Trinidad, but within the Caribbean region, I leave with your ladies and gentlemen the whole issue of this can only be achieved through an all of government all of community approach where everybody is responsible for the establishment of disaster risk reduction and disaster risk management and in doing so it sets the foundation with those pillars and that ring beam that now holds the structure together to allow us to be a resilience community this, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Captain Wint. As usual, just as I expected, a presentation that was concise to the point and gave the necessary information. At this time, I would like to field questions from our audience. If you have questions at this time, please forward them to us. But while we await questions coming in, I have one uh, question also to say, stirring the pot as we say. Can you, from your experience, identify any one variable that we as a society or a community, I should say, can focus on to be able to improve our response and our ability to respond to our emergencies, disasters, et cetera. Because as we, we see this morning in Trinidad, there's a lot of rain and we know what comes with that, the possibilities. So from your experience, do you see anything that we can do as a community you know, that can assist in our response being a bit more effective? Uh, I would say the whole issue of understanding your risk and the confidence of, of being prepared and therefore understand that you have a responsibility. Um, so once you understand the risk, um, take the necessary actions to mitigate the impact because now we are seeing the whole issue of uh, climate change. We are seeing the 100 year incidents occurring and where we can look globally, where you have 
one year's rainfall in five hours. Regardless of how government agencies and individuals clean drains, you will have that hazard impact from flooding. So it's to understand where you are, understand the risk, um, get involved and educate yourself of what is happening. And therefore, you can mitigate the severity of the impact to individual communities and even government. And therefore, once individuals do that, I am of the view that we can be in a better place to explain. You mentioned two things there that caught my attention, understanding the risk and educating yourself. And I think the factor of understanding the risk is something that we as a community really need to come to terms with based on our geographic location, you know, based on the, the surroundings, what do we have in our environment that can put us at risk? And I think that's very important for, for the general public within our society to understand. The educating yourself aspect, that takes me into something else that I noted from your presentation. You spoke about comprehensive training. Do you believe that within our own emergency management or disaster management system at the community level, at the regional corporation level, we have sufficient training accessible for the general public that would allow them to become equipped in the manner of which we speak? Yes, I believe that. And I would like to compliment the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government, who within the last two years have been expanding its suit program to ensure that the community to which they serve are prepared. And therefore, agencies that are involved in risk management in terms of people have expended millions of dollars in preparing persons for it. I too have my disappointment in how some people, persons have accepted the training, um, but yes, uh, there are avenues and it is available for everybody to be trained. Um, Spiani Labor College, uh, College of Labor has they are marked on what I would call some of the landmark initiatives that allows even emergency risk management and one of the few institutions in Toronto to be able to offer it. So the training is there at the local level, at the tertiary level, and even at the governmental level, they are scholarships that, will, that is being made available to individuals who want to study risk management. So it is there, it is for us to avail ourselves and understand by not doing that what the implications. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I like the way you, you emphasize that Cipriani Labor College has pioneered in that area. And as I said in, in my opening remarks, really this event is about making people aware, giving them that awareness of how they can access and, and how they can play their part in the role of emergency and disaster management within Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, at this time, I haven't seen us with any questions coming to us, but what I will do is if questions come on your issue, um, your area after, I will feel those questions and I will forward them to you as soon as possible for response. Thank you very much. As I said, I'll be in and out, so I'll, I'll hold on for a little while, but I'll, I'm still committed to the event today. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Captain Wint, again for your dedication and for your, you know, your presentation this morning. That was very enlightening. At this time, I would like to introduce another speaker. She's no stranger to us, Ms. Julie Samaru. She's an adjunct lecturer at the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. Her presentation this morning, the community role in mitigating disasters and emergencies. And even as you know, uh, Captain Wint has paved the way kind of for Ms. Samaru to come in and speak in more detail. A bio of Ms. Samaru, as a former student of the Cipriani, College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. Ms. Samaru pursued emergency management courses at all levels from the 10 Saturday program to the certificate and then the diploma. She then pursued an MSc in risk crisis and disaster management as a Leicester University London and continued her educational enhancement by completing an MSc in adult education at Walden University in the United States of America. At present, she is in the final stages of completing her PhD in emergency management at Walden. 
In 2009, she joined the Security Administration and Emergency Management Department as an adjunct lecturer, and to date has taught most of the modules in the emergency management courses. The primary student population of those courses being members of the Ministry of National Security. Ms. Samaru has conducted outreach emergency programs in several communities in Trinidad, partnered with the Ministry of National Security in conducting CERT training for the students of the MyLat MyPart programs, the Water and Sewage Authority, and the Sao Lavantel Regional Corporation. Additionally, she has been a participant and an evaluator in several of the airport authorities full scale exercises and the lead inspector evaluator for all mini evacuation exercises conducted by Caribbean Airlines for recertification as required by the FAA. This morning, I want to welcome representing the females amongst us, Ms. Julie Samaru. Over to you, Ms. Samaru. Your mic is muted, Ms. Samaru. Good morning, Arlene, and thank you for that introduction. And you are quite right. I am representing the females within the college in this particular field. And I also want to acknowledge that Captain Wint, in fact, did pave the way for my discussion this morning, which in fact leads me into the role of a community in mitigating disasters and emergencies. We are now in the rainy season in the Caribbean for all the persons in other parts of the world who are looking on. And we do have been experiencing quite a lot of flooding. And you sometimes wonder why it is every year we go through the same issues as it relates to this particular hazard. How is it that we are not making any major improvements in the way we deal with this particular issue? But as Captain Wynne says, it starts with the individual. And this is where I am going to focus today. And I am going to start off by asking you a question. Have you thought about how you can make a difference in your community and assist with mitigating disasters and emergencies? You probably have not, but you do have a role that you can play. But first let's understand what is mitigation. Disaster mitigation measures are actions taken to alleviate or reduce the impact of risks and hazards through proactive measures taken before the emergency or the disaster occurs. Now there are two types of mitigation measures that you can employ. You have structural mitigation and you have non-structural mitigation. Now, structural mitigation is the physical construction or acts of protecting from disaster or hazards. And let's look at some examples. A family reinforces their home to make it safer from earthquakes and flooding. You are looking at building drains to allow greater water flow you're putting sandbags and you're learning how to in fact use the sandbags to be able to protect your home, especially if you live in a flood prone area. Then we have non-structural. The non-structural measure, you do not have to do any physical construction, but what you use is knowledge. Knowledge of policies and laws, 
you're looking at raising public awareness you're looking at training and education and this is where you can make a difference in your community by becoming a member of suit now the previous presenter did in fact mention suit but what is suit cert is the acronym for community emergency response team. This is where you get a group of people organized as a neighborhood team and you get them trained to enhance their ability to recognize, to respond to and recover from major emergencies or disaster situations. So it's take on many roles in a community and they seek to alleviate suffering, not only during a disaster, but also before and after. As a result of the training, CERT members are prepared to serve their community, not only in disaster response, but in disaster preparedness mitigation, which we are going to be looking at, and recovery as well. In our later presentation, you will get some more details on the different phases of disaster management, and you will have a greater appreciation of how suit fits in to each of these phases. Now let's look at before disaster. CERTs can provide a means of preparing their communities for disaster by learning about preventative measures. And in that way, you can, in fact, assist your community and ensure that your family is safe. Then you look at during the disaster. When the disaster occurs, there is usually widespread damage and that creates more needs that can be immediately dealt with by the professional emergency responders. They may become quite overwhelmed and sometimes we question why it takes so long for them to get to where you are or to do anything. At times, these responders may be delayed because of infrastructure damage or other causes. And this is where CERT can assist the local communities until the professional responders arrive. Now, after disaster, that's after all of the damage, the critical phase of disaster has passed. It means that you now have to look at opportunities for rebuilding, for trying to get back to some type of normalcy. Now for you to fully appreciate what CERT is all about, let me give you a brief historical background. The origin of the idea of CERT arose from the city of Los Angeles Fire Department in the USA. The beginning of the pilot program started after two key events. One was the exposure of a different culture's handling of disaster preparedness in Japan and a large scale event that yielded disastrous outcomes in Mexico City. In 1985, a group of the Los Angeles fire officials traveled to the Japan to study the country's preparedness plan, especially for earthquake disasters. And what they found was very creative plan for disaster response that heavily emphasized the training of neighborhoods into single function teams. 
They were trained to alleviate potential disaster scenarios that could follow a large scale earthquake. Later in September of that same year, an investigation team was sent to a large scale earthquake which registered 8.1 on a Richter scale. And this devastated Mexico City. The earthquake killed more than 10,000 persons and more than 30,000 were injured. A group of persons within the neighborhood got together and volunteered to conduct light search and rescue within their communities. And while they did in fact achieve a hundred rescues at the same time, sorry, they achieved 800 successful rescues. At the same time, a hundred volunteers died during a 15 day span of the operation. The death of those volunteers was attributed largely to the fact that these volunteers were not trained to deal with this type of disaster. And arising out of that, it was noted both nationally and internationally that training was indeed the answer of addressing these types of issues. Therefore, from the evidence provided by the disastrous events of Mexico City, it became evident that some level of civilian training was absolutely necessary to provide for the safety, especially of the volunteers when responding to disasters, as well as the survivors they were trying to assist. Now CERT is a program that has grown rapidly throughout the world, more so in Trinidad and Tobago. And they have become an integral part of the country's management, disaster management system. That's why there's a need for trained civilians who, as Captain Wynn mentioned earlier on, are the first responders. Persons from the community are the ones who are generally there on the spot and sees what happens. And they perform basic functions of responding agencies until they arrive. At this point, I must give credit, however, to Assistant Fire Chief of the Los Angeles Fire Department, Frank Borden, who developed the concept of suit in 1986 and which was adopted by FEMA in 1991 for training civilian volunteers. And suits are in every state within the United States. Now we hear talk about training. What are some of the training that suits will have to undergo? Well, there are pro approximately nine modules in the training program. And it starts off with disaster preparedness. You do not wait until the disaster to try to prepare. You want to do that beforehand. And there are simple things that you can do. You can look around your house and see what needs to be done. Look at the trains, make sure they're clean. If you have branches hanging over your electrical wiring, you can call an agency and they will come and cut that. You could prepare a family emergency plan. Most importantly, ensure that all your personal important documents are safe. Those are some of the basic things that you as an individual can do. Then we look at fire suppression. Within the past couple of months and days, we have had fires that has caused 
great morning throughout this country. And while you are only going to be learning about dealing with small fires, the fires do start small. So you're going to learn how to use fire extinguisher. How you can get into a smoke filled room and get out. And then you will learn about disaster medical operations. There are two parts to this training. One in which you will learn how to perform and conduct triage. How to assess the survivors so that they can be tagged. In this way, you can determine who needs immediate attention to be sent to medical facilities. And then the second part will teach you about dealing with injuries, how to treat the different type of injuries that you will see. Then we look at search and rescue operations. A building has collapsed. You hear voices emanating from that building. What do you do? You will learn what to do before you go into the building. You will also learn what to do when you get inside the building. You will learn extrication techniques. You will also learn techniques of taking people out. So you will learn carry techniques because some of the persons might not be able to just walk out. Now CERT has a, a structure there is an organizational structure that you must follow. So in developing your suit within your community, there are specific guidelines that you must follow. You will be exposed to that. At the end of disasters, both survivors and first responding agencies they will be suffering from trauma. And it means that some of them will probably need psychological assessments for a long time after recovery. You will learn how to actually see some of these signs and know that these persons all need to have psycho psychological assessments. Now, Around the globe, we hear all around terrorism. And while suits will not be first responders in terrorism, there is a role that they will play in the community by ensuring that the community is way not involved in that particular area, but look out for their safety. And at the end of the training program, the participants get to showcase what they would have learned. Having developed within themselves a disaster scenario, they are now going to demonstrate through simulation all the functions performed by the first responding agencies that they have learned. And they will also get an opportunity to evaluate that performance. This is the culmination of the training. When that is completed, you have performed a complete suit training program. When utilized effectively, suits can empower a community to prepare for and respond to disaster situations. They provide a means for citizens to take responsibility for their own safety by providing them with basic disaster response skills. Training as a mitigation measure serves in educating a community about measures to reduce the impact of a disaster situation through teaching mitigation practices. And this is an effective method to ensure that community members are professionally trained 
in order to provide relief and assistance to disaster survivors without compromising their safety. As I mentioned earlier, CERT members are volunteers. This is strictly something that you want to be a part of. And in doing so, you are able to give back to your community, but also make a contribution to the country as a whole. I will end as I started with a question. Can you now see how you can assist your community in mitigating against disasters and preparedness? Suit is the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Samuel. Very, very comprehensive. You made it simple. And you know, that impact of what CERT is about should have been received by all who were listening. And you built on what Captain Wint had started. So it was just a smooth flow. Thank you very much for that presentation. At this time, I have some questions sent uh, for Captain Wint. And I am supposing they would come in for you also, Ms. Samarine, a little bit. To Captain Windsor, and one of our participants wants to know how are communities sensitized into dealing with disasters? She says she has never seen anything done in her community. Uh, so when we speak of sensitization, what do we mean by sensitization? Captain Wint? Well, Ali, I could take that for Captain Wint. You can take the question. Yeah. Yes, you can take it on his behalf. Yes. As I mentioned before, we are looking at um, awareness. Now, if we look at, let's say for the month of May, the ODPM in Trinidad and Tobago through the um, permission and cooperation of the government, launched May month as disaster reduction month. And there were several sessions online because at this point, you know, you can't go out into the community. So mm -hmm. they did in fact have a series of quest, uh, seminars, training, especially search training throughout the month of May. There were articles published in the newspapers. And you would find that this is a way of sensitizing people as it relates to disasters. Before the rainy season, there's information put out and they keep telling you in terms of if something happens in the rainy season, you can access, let's say, sandbags. You could go to your regional corporation. They have listed the numbers of all the DMUs that you can call because they will be the first agencies within each community that you can reach out to if you need assistance. So there is a wide range of information available. It is just that the only unfortunate part within these times is that whereas before you would have had community meetings you would have been able to go to communities and have these sensitization sessions. Unfortunately, in this pandemic time, you have to be reliant on social media and to be able for people to understand what is happening. Unfortunately, that's the only way that they will be able to get information. I hope that answers the person's question. Yes, I think it I think it does. I think it does. And you use the term there, DMUs. And I just want to, you know, define it for our listeners, uh, disaster management units, when you hear the term DMUs used. And these are within the various regional corporations and are responsible for the management of the disasters themselves. Thank you very much. Another question was asked as to the ability to access the disaster preparedness uh, policy document. And I, I think I could have answered that, but I would allow you to answer um, in terms of, of, of that. Again, if you access 
the ODPM website. The ODPM website is a library. It has all the information that you would want to find out about disaster preparedness, our policies, how you access any information from any of the agencies involved in disaster management. There is a document available, or I should say documents available on the ODPM website. And it is quite accessible. When you go on uh, the website, you will get information about, even as um, Captain Wynn spoke about earlier on, the Sendai framework, all of that information is accessible and it is, uh, it is easily accessible online. Thank you very much for that. Uh, there are no additional questions at this time, but at our next question and answer session, if there are questions for you, I will, you know, let you know same. Thank, Thank you, you very much again. Thank you very much again, Ms. Samuel. As we move along this morning, we want to welcome a gentleman who has stood not only in this field, but has stood for his country. This is the man in the person of Colonel Dave Williams, former CEO of the ODPM. A retired Colonel of the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, Colonel Williams has experience that would have spanned it as director of the National Emergency Management Agency in the Ministry of National Security. As the director, he established a credible, comprehensive disaster management practice in Trinidad and Tobago, coordinated the response activities of state and non-state agencies regarding local disaster emergencies, functioned effectively as a member of the committee established to administer national emergency relief funding. He also oversaw the securing and implementation of several disaster management capacity enhancing projects within Trinidad and Tobago, assisted in the coordination of disaster relief activities of the local contingent in Grenada in the wake of Hurricane Ivan, directed a rapid needs assessment team, the RNET in Dominica as a result of Hurricane Lenny, Colonel Williams, in his capacity as the CEO of the Office of Disaster Preparedness Management, was responsible for the Trinidad and Tobago coordination aspect. He represented Trinidad and Tobago on behalf of the Ambassador of Matters of Defense and Security, promoted the interests of Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force in his capacity. Colonel Williams is the holder of an MSc in Risk, Crisis and Disaster Management, a Diploma in International Disaster Management, a Diploma in International Disaster Management in Civil Defense from the Civil Defense Academy in Singapore. He also is the holder of a Postgraduate Diploma in International Relations. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, I would like to welcome Colonel Dave Williams to speak to us on the use of social media technologies in disaster emergencies. Colonel Williams. Over to you, Colonel Williams. I'm not sure if he's hearing me, but at this time, I'd like to take the opportunity to speak a bit about the programs offered at the Cipriani Labor College in the area of that disaster preparedness and emergency management. Currently, there's an offering of a one-year part-time diploma program in emergency management. It's open to all persons who hold a certificate in emergency management, as well as practitioners in the field. Acknowledge we at the college acknowledge their experience and it is equaled with the outcomes of the certificate program. Some of the outcomes of the program 
represent uh, at the end of the program, students would have gained knowledge in the representation of communities and agencies in disaster preparedness, develop and design mitigation strategies. They would be able to advise agencies and communities on risk reduction plans. And we would have heard both uh, Captain Wint and Ms. Samaru speak about that risk reduction aspect advise stakeholders on disaster impact expectations to aid in their decision making <clears throat> and develop and design disaster plans to minimize the threats of terrorism and other man-made disasters. So that is just an offering that we have here at the Cipriani Labor College. So at this time, I would like to open the floor for Colonel Dave Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair, are you hearing me? Yes, I am, loud and clear, sir. Oh, okay. Um, so thank you for that invitation. Uh, um, let, let me try to bring up my, my, uh, my, um, yeah, let me try to, try to bring up my presentation. Um, Madam Chair, you could take over while I, while I ha have this, uh, have another challenge here, please. So back okay, to you for a while. Not a problem. Thank not you. a problem, sir. Not a problem. Right. So as we were speaking about the diploma program, uh, there is also a certificate program that is offered. That certificate program in emergency management is a one-year part-time certificate program. And that program is also open to all persons who have completed an introductory course in crisis management and to other individuals who have had at least three years training or experience and background in the field. Uh, there is a 10 Saturday program that is offered from time to time at the establishment, and that would also be a springboard, so to speak, to enter that certificate program. In this program, we would speak on uh, issues such as risk management in the private and public sectors. We would also speak about emergency management professionals who will be relied upon to protect the public in an event of major emergencies. And as I speak on that area of emergency management professionals, uh, Ms. Samaru would have mentioned the part of the CERT training and, and speaking about that part that, that is training persons to recognize emergencies and to be able to treat for minor emergencies. And so I take the opportunity to you know, speak to our listening audience. There may be persons in the audience who are already in the field of emergency medical response and having a certificate in emergency management and even going further in emergency management can prove to be an asset to you who are already employed as emergency medical providers. You would also cover in this program, government and industrial emergency management planners uh, who prepare the potential emergency uh, designs for you know, the evacuation plans, et cetera, speaking about equipment used in emergency management and even allowing us to, to expose you, the attendee, to professionals and additional skills that are part of that cadre of skills within emergency and disaster preparedness planning. So you see here where there are a host of tools which would be offered to you both in the diploma and the certificate. It would depend upon you, the individual, where you're at, what you want to achieve. But these are programs that are definitely recommended for persons who are looking at careers within emergency management or disaster management, and even persons within the Ministry of National Security, persons within the Ministry of National Security who are seeking to be able to, you know, uh, expand themselves in a particular manner. So, you know, it is really, really a, a part of a tool, a toolkit, I should say, that can be used for 
your advancement. I just want to go back a bit to the presentations that were held before. And Captain Wind would have mentioned that we need to accept responsibility within our societies. And I'll take this opportunity to highlight that aspect a bit in speaking about our responsibility as the, the community, as the homeowners, as the landowners, as the business owners within the community. What we see happening we often look to the regional corporations, to the government, and we say that's their responsibility for maintaining, keeping us abreast, et cetera. But we have to realize that based on the global village, we speak about global warming. The whole dynamic of the world's climate is changing. Things are happening so rapidly that we need to keep up within ourselves. Yes, it is the responsibility of the stakeholders, the government and the regional authorities, but it is also our responsibility to keep abreast of what's happening in the world, in that global village. Recently, we would have seen that there were some fires in the United States of America. Hundreds of people would have lost their homes. You would have seen cars being caught on fire, fire on either side of the road, you know. And in Canada, um, in Nova Scotia, there were some fires also. And we're looking at this and seeing it happening more often every year. And this is, this is their disaster. But within our own context, we see the weather patterns changing for us. We see that the rainfall is even more frequent or even more heavy than it would have been in previous years. And so we need to be aware of these things, be aware of where we throw our garbage, be aware of the trees that we decide we need to cut down or remove and how we dispose of these items, because these are the items that are found in our waterways after the flood subsides. So it's not always about the dredging aspect. It is also about us, you know, shouldering that responsibility for keeping our environment clean and keeping our environment free and ready and prepared for the eventuality that may come. Ms. Samaru, I just want to involve you in the conversation here for a little bit. From your experience uh, with the CERT training, do you think that enough persons from the communities actually respond. And if you can give our listeners a little information on how they can actually sign up or register for that, you know, for those CERT programs, because persons, you, we, we say the internet, but some people, you know, generally in our society, we go to the internet for Facebook, we go to the internet for YouTube and that kind of thing. So the average layman who is not about research, how can they access and do you think it's being accessed, you know, as it should be? Okay, hey, Ali, that's, that's a, a very good question because <clears throat> as I mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned earlier, the regional corporation and Ministry of Local Government, they've really been pushing suit within the community, more so in terms of promoting it uh, during the month of May, but and beyond. People are accessing the program. There is no doubt that they are. But the feedback that I have gotten from a lot of the areas is that while the persons are attending and they are in fact participating in the training, when you need them, you do not get them mm -hmm. because I think in some instances they misunderstand the word volunteer. The word volunteer means that you are doing it out of yourself. You want to give back. And I think in some instances, some of them are looking for a monetary reward, which is, is not intended. It is purely intended to be a volunteer movement <clears throat> from it in the community. Now you can access it by going to any of the regional corporations and asking when their next suit program will be put on, or as well, they could probably contact the Ministry of Rural Development, but more so you have us. We run those programs 
every year. It's part of the diploma program. But you do not only get a certificate in, or completion of suit. You get a whole certificate in, in the diploma. So that would be an added bonus to the person because you're not only doing suit, you're doing a lot more. Excellent, excellent. Even as I spoke about the programs, thank you very much for that, Ms. Samaru. Thank you very much. And I see we have Colonel Williams on. Colonel Williams, I will hand over to you at this time, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I trust that everyone is hearing me. Yes, we're hearing you loud yes. and clear. Okay, so um, I, I, without further ado, I, I think I'd like to get straight into my presentation, which um, essentially is a PowerPoint. Um, so let me start with my screen sharing. Right, so every, I trust that everyone is seeing that. Yes, we are, sir. Right, so um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, um, we're looking at, at the use of social media in, in technologies and emergencies. And uh, I would like to, let me see how, yeah. yeah. So I'd like to, have it in a formal discussion where we're saying that essentially, um, I'd like to argue that social media is in fact a form of, of mass media. And, and therefore, if, if you could see it like that, I will proceed by giving you a historical perspective of, of mass media, um, look at some of the advantages and this, um, compare print media as, as, a, as opposed to electronic media. And then, speak more specifically to the role of mass media in emergency, because remember we're starting off by saying that social media is a form of mass media. And um, closing off with some of the pros and cons of, of the use of this, um, this form of mass media. So, what is social media? And I'm sure everybody is familiar with it, but just to be certain that for the purpose of this little discussion that we will have, we, we see that social media refers to um, the means of, of interactions among people, right? In which they create the, the communities and the networks, right? So, so in, this, in this sense, um, social media clearly is about people meeting people, people and people exchanging information, right? A, a more dictionary type um, definition is that it's a form of electronic communication. And I want to emphasize, I want you to, to pay attention to that because we're going to, that that's exactly the, the, the thread I want to use to, um, to create this, this, as we go through this discussion. So again, it's a form of electronic communication through which users create online communities. So it's for people sharing information with people. And of course, there are various types. There are social networks. We know Facebook, we know LinkedIn. There are bookmarking sites, social news sites, media sharing sites. And all of this is just to not only give us a feel for all that is included in social media, but again, to make the point that really it is a form of mass media. Um, the traditional view of mass media is that mass media falls into two, two categories, print and electronic. And, and we, we do a little historical overview of, of that. Um, mass media, what is mass media? Communication channels used for the mass dissemination of information to the public, plain and simple. Print, do the same thing, but in the print format. And electronic uh, channels that broadcast information, unlike print, through electronic means. And of course, the most common um, examples of these uh, radio and television. So clearly, radio and television 
form one aspect of mass media and there's also print media. So in a sense, we're very familiar with mass media. And therefore, um, we could see why the, the argument could be made that social media is in fact a form of mass media. So once we get, jumping off from that, we could, we could see how, how as a form of mass media, the, um, how, how mass media could be used um, in the management of emergencies. So, and that's the slant I want to take. So uh, as a form of mass media, the newspaper is one of the oldest means of communication that, still be that can still be relied on. Again, in terms of um, the management of emergencies and disasters, the, media, uh, the print media, the newspaper could be used for early morning as well as for all kinds of messages. And, and we will hear about early warning and, and, and response and, and recovery later on in this webinar. The good thing is that the newspaper is widely circulated and in the, in the scenario where um, television stations can't operate because of, of, of the particular um, situation on the ground in terms of a disaster emergency, a, a newspaper could be always brought in by helicopter if necessary. So there is, there is also other printed material like, like magazines and journals, uh, and they tend to target a more specific audience. And so the, the use of other printed material other than newspapers, um, use could be made of it to reach particular audiences and uh, to share emergency management related information. We now have, of, of course, we're very familiar with billboards. We see them on the highway all the time, right? And even aerial banners. Um, that, that's where the, the banner is attached to an, an aircraft. That, that, um, that too is a form of printed, um, print media, but a, a print mass media. So it's called um, outdoor media or out of home media. So we, we now switch to the other form of media, electronic media, right? Of course, the radio is the most popular, that's the one we know a long, long time, right? Because it's affordable, widespread reach. And we know that radio could reach people from all walks of life and even in the remotest, in the, in the remotest places. There is also though, something that we probably don't consider as much, which is satellite radio. And satellite radio is particularly useful because um, especially in, uh, and, emergency or disaster scenario where we may have lost our, our um, radio transmission towers, satellite radio is, is, is beaming the information directly from satellites back to earth. And therefore um, it's, it, it, it could, A, it could reach very remote areas and, and B, um, it, it's not dependent on, on um, you know, the availability of, of electricity and so on. The television form of electronic media, as we know, is a very powerful tool. Um, and it's powerful because it not only gives us images, but it also gives us sound. So the visual impact of the television um, is a great way for us to get messages about, um, the, about emergency management. And finally, we come to the internet. Um, in the past, agencies, including emergency management agencies, um, 
they were able to ask us. So we were able to basically compose ourselves in that crisis or disaster situation because at, up to then, we had the power to control whatever the messaging want. However, with the advent of the internet, that is no longer the case. Um, and information now spreads like wildfire. Sometimes even before the authorities um, are even aware that an emergency exists. And that has created challenges for, for us in, in disaster management. So we look now at, at the role of mass media in, from a historical perspective in, in, in emergency management. And we see that the media, right, forges are direct link between the public and emergency organizations. And therefore they play, the, the media can play a very uh, important role in disseminating vital information before, during, and after disasters. The media assists us, and by every time I say media, for, folks, please bear in mind, I mean mass media. And therefore, if I'm making the point that social media is a form of mass media, uh, make that link as well, right? So the media assist us in, in, in educating the public about disasters and warning of hazards in gathering and transmitting information. The, the media is able to alert um, the, the government officials and, and emergency management officials about the existence of a, of a disaster as well as um, the specific needs of, of affected people and so on. And the media has also allowed us to hold discussions about, about disaster preparedness and, and the fact that um, we, you know, we need to be always prepared and, 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 and on ways of how, how to improve our general emergency preparedness. These are just some of the sort of particular characteristics of, of, of um, print media versus electronic media, right? Uh, we see that print media, of course, yeah, uses the print format, um, electronic media uses the electronic medium. Print media was here first, electronic media came afterwards. Print media is not available to us 24 seven, whereas electronic media is, right? Uh, so those are some of the, uh, and you can see it on your screen, the, the sort of how, how print media weighs up or weighs against uh, electronic media. Again, in the print media tends to have deadlines um, electronic, electronic media, including mass, uh, mass media, doesn't. Um, and you can't have, as we are having now, a live discussion via, of course, print media, but we can do so through electronic media because right now we're having a, a, live, um, a live event with, with, with people sharing information back and forth. So does the media play a special role in disaster management? Well, of course, of course the media does, right? Because disasters as, as, a, as we could well appreciate are significant so sources of news and therefore capture the attention of people. So therefore media, um, again, mass media, and in that regard, we will say social media provides an opportunity for, for visibility and therefore, if used properly, can be of tremendous value to those of us in disaster and emergency management in the following ways, right? It could be used for lobbying, right? So, so whether it's print media or electronic media, 
we could lobby for political commitments. We could to make uh, national leaders more responsive because, because of that, that, that lobbying, that intense um, attention. So by applying pressure to public office, officials, media, mass media, right, including social media, can have a positive uh, change um, for unique areas that would otherwise have been ignored. So, uh, the media uh, helps us to, or enables us to cause uh, disaster risk issues to, to gain priority. Again, the ability of media to influence government, um, to, to, to make disaster management issues, um, high, pri high priority issues. So, so, so that disaster management issues are not, um, let's say, made secondary to self-serving political interests at the expense of the wider population. So, for example, as, as an example, the media may expose excessive and inefficient expenditure um, to, to relocate persons from vulnerable areas just before an election with a view to supposedly securing votes while um, no attention is being paid to replenishing stock. So, so, so what we're saying here is that by paying attention to what the government does, we, we could ensure that well, scarce funds are used more for preparing our communities um, to better face the, the onslaught of hazards and emergence uh, that disasters and emergencies as opposed to doing doing um, spending resources for purely for political gain the media can also help disaster mitigation experts uh, um, create early warning systems by, again, researching and presenting information about uh, technologies that can aid the development of useful concepts and systems. So, uh, you know, and, and, the, and this is the kind of, of role that the media ha has played in the past to, to, to bring information into the, into the public space on the issue of disaster management. Of, of disaster and emergency management. So clearly there's a role for the media. And when I say the media, again, mass media in this regard. The media can also trigger in donations from the international community subsequent to the occurrence of, of a disaster, as well as push governments to increase budgetary allocations for disaster response programs, of course, um, subsequent to, right, or in the future, if they hadn't done it in the past. The media can also improve coordination um, of risk assessment activities, because it's, 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 it's not uncommon to find agencies working um, in, in the, in the field of emergency management to not um, be talking to each other. Uh, but but with, with, the, with the media as a watchdog, um, they can in fact pick up this lack of coordination and by highlighting it, um, help to improve the coordination between, uh, between these, these bodies. So in terms of the impact, what we have to remember is that media, mass media, right? And, but, and even social media, these are just tools to us in the disaster management. Um, and therefore, uh, there are tools that can yield positive or negative results depending on how it is used. So the point being made here is that, yes, we have these tools, 
but we must uh, be careful and, 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 and be about how we use it. So let's look at some of the positive effects, right? The, the media is usually the first to define the event as an official disaster because, well, especially the, the in broadcast media, really electronic media, people go to the site, they see what they see, and they describe what they see. And, and the media is often the first to define as an event as an official disaster. The media provides instantaneous information and are trusted, are considered as trusted sources. Well, I suppose we, we could argue that some media houses could be considered uh, trusted, but as a, as a grouping, yes, they're trusted. Now, again, we have to be mindful of when we talk about media and we talk about mass media, and we talk about social media in particular, you know, there are things about social media, there are aspects of social media that we have to be mindful of. So it, um, is all social media trusted sources? Um, the answer is, is no. But nonetheless, uh, the media, electronic media, mass media, but, but mostly electronic media and therefore social media is an inv invaluable asset because they can, you know, it, it gets information out um, to people. And, and, and in terms of social media networks, with respect to this example being here, um, people are able to know via their smartphones which areas are impossible or, 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 or which, um, you know, where is the most destruction and so on and so on. So clearly, the, the media. And in this case, and we're saying here, electronic, by extension, social media uh, could be an invaluable asset in times of disaster. But of course, there are, there are negative aspects as well. The media may exaggerate some elements of, of the disaster and create unnecessary panic. Um, we may have an inaccurate portrayal of human behavior or overemphasis. Right of, of of bad behavior, where and, and not a sufficient um, emphasis being played on 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 on, on good behavior. It's, it's also possible that um, influential politicians could manipulate the media for personal or political gain, and in 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 some circumstances, of course, um, media reporters could prove to be biased um, for purposes of sensationalism. So um, it, it is not that media, you know, doesn't have its, 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 its flaws, but, um, you know, nonetheless, there are good aspects and, 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 and negative aspects to uh, mass media. So it, it is, it is, important to recognize that um, the convergence of media generally occurs after a national disaster and therefore a plan to effectively manage media should be part of every disaster plan and part of a standard operational procedures. Arrangements need to be put in place to monitor social media platforms um, to enable disaster management agencies are, to be able to counter the negative influences of, of social media. Because, as I said before, you know, the agencies need to be aware of, of what is being put out there so that if wrong information, um, misleading information is, is being put out there, then um, the, 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 the agencies are able now to counter that by putting out factual information. Um, mass media can educate, can warn, can inform, and empower people 
to take practical steps to protect themselves from natural disasters, right? And therefore, social media as a form of electronic mass media can be used to achieve this in, in, in all phases of, of emergency management. Okay. Um, the point is to, so we have made the point that you have um, social, social media is in fact um, mass media. And, and we've seen how mass media has a very important role in, in, in not only responding to emergencies, but this whole business of, of preparing, um, preparing so our societies for, for disasters and emergencies. Um, other, other technological tools and, 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 and clearly um, social media is in fact a technological, a technological tool, uh, but other technological tools exist. And uh, I, I, I will defer to my, to, to my fellow presenter who, who um, I'm sure will elaborate on, uh, on these tools. So ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's it from me and I will take questions at the appropriate time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Colonel Williams for that informative presentation. And you really brought to the fore what we probably don't think about much as it relates to disaster uh, management and preparedness in terms of the media, the different categories of media, you know, mass media, the social media, really bringing that all together and helping us to become aware of the different types of media. Because when you say media in this time, persons only think of a particular, you know, when we say media, they looked at a specific group, but not understanding that that's only a specific type. Uh, the historical perspective was really very interesting to me because I would have learned some things in there about media. And so I'm sure our audience would have gained such knowledge also. The part that impacted me the most would have been the impact of media because even in other fields such as psychology and criminology, sociology, et cetera, the, the impact of media is seen as, as being very influential or heavily influential in how the society views issues and topics. And we look at the, the COVID-19 virus, the different perspectives based on the use of media. And we even look at the floods that have occurred in Germany recently, mm -hmm. the perspectives that we get based on media. And so really, really understanding how media plays an important role, I think is something that we needed to hear this morning. So thank you very much for that presentation, Colonel Williams. I don't see any questions coming in thus far um, at this time, but I would like to thank you. And if any questions come in when we have question and answers a little later on, you will be called upon to respond. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I'm at right, this I'm time, right yes. As we continue this morning, we want to invite another speaker who is no stranger to us. Uh, he is part of our faculty at the Cipriani Labor College, Mr. Colin Baldio Singh. He's an adjunct lecturer at the Cipriani Labor College. Mr. Baldio Singh is an ICT professional and an educator. He has had more than 20 years experience in the field of ICT and geographic information systems. His knowledge has been applied to several organizations, both government and private, and in the capacity of an ICT professional and an educator. Academically, he is a holder of a bachelor's degree in agriculture, a master's in geographical information systems from the University of the West Indies. He also holds Microsoft certifications and several diplomas. Among his achievements, he has attended uh, the University of Cambridge uh, conference on 
the use of GIS national base mapping and lease management, trained several oil companies in the health and safety sector. He has also demonstrated GIS flood models to government officials and technocrats in the use of technology in treating with flood events. And just as we would have just come off of Colonel Williams' presentation on the media, this presentation on technology falls right in there. Mr. Baldeo Singh has also coached people uh, about crossing the digital divide and becoming computer and ICT literate. Because what we find is that within our own society, we tend to stick with the basics of and not really coming out of our comfort zone. And, and Mr. Baldeo Singh has coached persons in that area. He's flexible, adaptable, and uh, mm -hmm. considers himself to be a cornerstone in his convictions and approaches to life. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome to the floor this morning, Mr. Colin Baldio Singh to present on the application of technology in disaster mm -hmm. management. Over mm -hmm. to you, Mr. Baldio Singh. Welcome this morning. It is good to see you. It is Thank you, good morning, um, Ms. Paul. And thank you, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my presentation. Everyone seeing it? All right, um, this is technology. Um, applications in emergency management and disaster management. Now, um, in identifying this um, um, program started, and my colleague just spoke about it, but to provide some perspective with regard to emergency management, I would like to um, outline what a hazard is. And a hazard is anything in the workplace that has the potential to do harm. Right, remember it's the potential to harm. Hazards can include objects in the workplace such as machinery and dangerous, dangerous um, chemicals, etc. Or hazards related to the way work is done. For instance, hazards on a production line could cause manual handling, excessive noise, and fatigue caused by the workplace. A risk, on the other hand, arises when it's possible that a hazard will actually cause harm. The level of risk will depend on factors such as how often the job is done, the number of workers involved, and how serious any injuries could occur. A hazard is something that can cause harm. So electricity and current, and the risk is the chance high or low that any hazard would actually cause a harm. So it's an interaction between the hazard and the risk. Hazard identification, and risk assessment provides a factual basis for activities proposed in the strategy portion of the hazard mitigation plan. An effective risk assessment informs proposed action by focusing attention and resources on the greatest risk. And this is where technology comes in. So the four basic components of a risk assessment are hazard identification, right? And so this morning, you could look at low-lying areas, impact of rainfall simulations, and affected populations. Profiling the hazard events, inventory of assets, estimation of potential human and economic loss based on the exposure and vulnerability of people, buildings, and infrastructure. A core challenge faced by emergency managers is how to prevent, prepare, mitigate, respond, and recover from a myriad of habits hazards. Several questions arrive when faced with this challenge. What hazards exist in my area? How frequently do they occur? How severe can they impact beyond the community infrastructure, property, and the environment? Which hazards pose the greatest threat to the humanity? So you have to, to the community. So you have to rank your hazards as well. There are three reasons why a hazard identification and risk assessment is useful to emergency management profession. It helps emergency management professionals prepare for the worst and or most likely risks, allows for the creation of exercises, training programs, and plans 
based on the most likely scenarios and saves times and resources by isolating hazards that can't occur in these designated area. Um, so oftentimes you find as sometimes an earthquake happens and people start to plan for earthquake, but the likelihood of another earthquake happen might not be that great. For example, if it occurs in the rainy season, the most likely hazard that would occur would be a flood event, much like what's going on right now. So this leads to, and other speakers will speak about this, the emergency management process model that involves mitigation, preparedness, response, recovery, and prevention. Emergency management process model and technology consideration. So when we have to apply technology to the emergency management process, um, process model and identifying risks, hazards, and so forth. The establishment, the establishment as outlined by my colleagues um, leads to a basic emergency process model as previously indicated. The application of technology can be applied to this process model, but you have to consider the right fit. A lot of time people hear about GIS or technology and go and do the card before the horse um, analogy. They buy the equipment without analyzing the problem. And therefore, the right fit of technology to the process model is always the best way to avoid inefficiencies and in these times, over budgets and, and, and the wrong fit of technology. The way outlined is, to, is a, to apply a system that has at its core a method to adapt and incorporate existing and new technologies into the emergency management process model. The systems used for this application of technology is GIS. And what is GIS? GIS consists of several things. It's a process model. At its core, it's the people. There's the data, the analysis of that data, hardware to provide the robustness to analyze that data, and the required software. All of these and each one of these could take months to give an overview because they go, they go a lot into a lot of detail. But the main purpose of a GIS, so the core, at its core, is the people. Train the people, people to use the software, to not afraid of the system, people to put the input in, and more importantly, people to change their traditional way of thinking into a modern way of thinking, meaning that moving away from paper-based systems and understand the, that data needs to be input into a system where it can be analyzed and retrieved. At its core, GIS has the spatial data infrastructure. And to think of, of it, if you want to think of a, a house, GIS is like the house. The spatial data infrastructure is the foundation of the house. Spatial in the infra, in infrastructure is the most important part of a GIS in terms of the building of a GIS. If the spatial data infrastructure is not correct, you will find that you will have mismatched, mis, mismatched data sets. People will not align their data sets properly. And when it comes for time to interchange data, they will not work. So if fire, department collects one set of information on a particular standard and police, and municipal collect information. If we have to use it to effect an emergency management response, they may not work because everybody will have a different infrastructure standard. So spatial data infrastructure is a whole network and framework of geospatial data. It involves everything from standards to data to databases to software. A data a desktop or a web GIS can be part of a spatial database infrastructure, but not the entire spatial database infrastructure. All parts are required for the use and analysis of spatial data as expressed in the following. The following. As we came up with the first, and the term spatial data infrastructure was coined in 1993 by the US National Research Council to denote a framework of technologies, policies, and institutional arrangements that together facilitate the creation, exchange, and use of geospatial data and related information sources across an information sharing community. Such a framework can be implemented narrowly 
to enable the sharing of geospatial information within an organization, or more broadly for use of national, regional, and global level. In all cases, an SDI will provide an institutionally sanctioned automated means of posting, discovering, evaluating, and exchanging geospatial information by, by participating information producers and users. So what Ezri is basically saying is that everybody needs to agree based on a particular standard and a commonality of use by which X information could be exchanged. Hunter also said that the five components Special of a GIS, spatial data, technologies, laws and policies, people, standards of data representation and transfer. Laws and policies are important because they also have an intellectual property and, and use as well, but they're also national, um, national security considerations in the use of certain types of data. For example, some of the army bases and police stations would not want detail information to be available to the public for that. Government and spatial data infrastructure. To promote the prosperity and security of citizens, governments at levels in all countries provide infrastructure of various kinds. To manage the, phys the physical the infrastructure requires communication and information structure, meaning that you must have your departments linked, broadband, um, connection, dark fiber and connection between your government departments so they could exchange information. <clears throat> Spatial data, data infrastructure play an important role because location information is important in managing everything that governments manage, such as roads, roads sewers, education, and public health. Like you, you need to know where the health centers are, the roads, traffic plans so as proximity, epidemiology, information, and so forth. Like most types of infrastructure, spatial data infrastructure also provides a platform for economic development, right? So in, in terms of economic development, you could also use it to build applications, location application, building applications. Uh, right now, um, there's also the construction permitting application is going on right now that you could supply um, building, building plans electronically and be processed electronically. This is in the pilot phase and it's also been a rule out. So government and spatial data infrastructure, this is an overview of a municipal office, a mapping agency, and the average user on the bottom here having access to all this information seamlessly on their phone. So what a modern spatial data infrastructure looks like. Client applications, and in some cases, server processes can now run on handheld devices as easily as desktop systems. And if you want to think about it, look at um, Google Maps, um, Waze, and some of these applications on your phone. Smartphones and other mobile devices make many new applications possible, right? So we can use it for a lot of processes, um, not just, um, Let's see, new game, um, Candy Crush and that kind of um, games. For example, motion sensors on phones and cases now um, with um, people on their phone, employees on their phone can now assess um, building plans and do assessment on buildings. That's, that's a new thing that has been rolled out. Um, data can be stored locally or it can be stored remote on remote department servers or on cloud servers. And that is um, an avenue that that um, we are heading into cloud servers and departmental servers. A modern SDI looks like this as compared to servers. So you have, everything comes as a service. You can buy a platform as a service, meaning servers and, and a particular development. You could buy hardware and everything comes in to a service and then it's outputted to the different levels of the organization. So this leads to the basics of geographic information systems. Geographic information systems matter because geography matters. In emergency management, location is the most important thing as previously outlined. Where are your assets? Where are your vulnerabilities? Where, where are your response patterns? Geography is the, the three dumbs. What is where? Why is it there and why do I care? And the last part is why do I care? 
And I would like to bring this to, if a tree falls in a forest, does it really fall? And most people would say, um, yes, it falls because the tree falls. But if nobody knows about it, it doesn't really matter. If a tree falls in the middle of Woodford Square or um, a couple of months ago on Pembroke Street, it matters because it impacts infrastructure and people. And therefore, those two events had city officials reevaluating all the trees and removing trees that were not um, in, in good health to prevent an occurrence of that, a mitigation strategy was done. So the, why do you care about that's where this comes in. To analyze everything, we need data. We need location data, the scale of the data, the scale meaning, um, the size of the maps, the size of the infrastructure. Um, if you take a map that's a tourist map, but you have to maintain roads, then your road infrastructure would only show um, one line rather than double lines. And then you have your data presentation. Data presentation, is where it's important, especially where you want to um, attract budgets or convince um, citizenry of a certain, certain course of action. So your data presentation after analysis is done in words, charts, graphs, tables, or maps, or a combination of all. And GIS turns data into information and knowledge. So it will be easily discernible for people to understand what you are trying to depict your analysis. So definition of GIS is a system of computer, software, hardware, and data, and personnel to help manipulate, analyze, and present information that is tied to a spatial location. A spatial location, usually a geographical location, information visualization of the, of a, of the and analysis of the data, system linking software, hardware, and data, and personnel. A thinking explorer who is key to the power of GIS. And just to um, highlight system as well, um, now the system also involves internet usage and use of broadband. What is not GIS? In isolation, GPS by itself is part of a GIS, but it's not a GIS. And that's GPS, which is um, to get your location on the earth using a, con a constellation of 24 satellites in orbit around the, the earth. A static map, a paper or digital map. Maps are often a product of a GIS, and we to visualize the analysis. So GIS is not the map that you're producing, but there's an output of that. And a software package. Now, most people would think a GIS, um, who, in, who is in it as the ESRI ArcGIS software, but that's a software package. But there are also other packages. We have free packages like QGIS, and we have basic packages like on Google Maps that you could go to map and create a basic database and upload pictures and stuff of what, what is taking place. Spatial data estimates up. Um, estimates are 80% of all data has a spatial component. So everything you collect has a, a, a location on the earth that you need to catalog. Um, now, if you are taking pictures of something, you can turn on, on your phone, the tag feature on your phone, and the coordinates are also attached to where you take that picture from. So if you are sending back an event, you can send it back to um, to your headquarters and they will know where this event takes place instead of trying to figure out um, where this location is or from a text. So in GIS, what we try to do is to visualize, manipulate, analyze, and display spatial data. So on a, on a map, we would see on Earth, we would have several things taking place. Some are on the surface, some below the, below the surface of the, of below the surface. Most people would not know what on the bottom is. What a GS attempts to do is to break everything down into layers. The parcels are taken out as one layer, the, uh, the districts, meaning the administrative boundaries, the streets, and the land use. And then we analyze this data to give our best use of the data. So smart maps link a database to the map. A database looks like this. 
it's hard for the average person to discern any patterns in something like this. It has all the information, but it does not really depict what you are looking for. Even if you query or question this data, it's hard to tell where things are located. Two ways to interpret and visualize data in the world. We have three models. We'll go through two of the models, or we'll highlight two models, the raster model and the vector model. The raster model comprises of pixels from satellite imagery, aerial photographs, which also include drone, drone footage, and gives a location. Location and then categorize. The vector or linear model takes a raster Im image and asks the uh, uh, data input person to take out every features by categorizing them into points, lines, and polygons. So, for example, you can take out the house, the lake, and then you have attributes or attributes are the description of the data, which is the size of the house, type of the house. So there's a road, the length of the road, material of the roads, and so forth. Then you could combine data from many sources. You have data from um, water management, land records, transportation, fire, and police. When these, this information is combined, you can now have an aggregation of the data available to you to pull together to see how one impact the other. For example, traffic conditions, if you're on an emergency route, um, if you want to um, drill a hole, what is under there, if there's any other utilities under, under the road. Data for GIS applications. So the data required is digitized and scan maps. Digitized mean you take the map from a scan map and you extract the information from it and put it on the screen. So example, you take all the roads and put it as one layer. So these can be purchased, donated free or created by the user. The creation of the user is a lengthy process. It requires a certain amount of skill as well. There's also databases and tables of data that you also have to prepare and have that data readily available to, 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 be, able to, to, to be able to align with the digitized or scan maps. There's GPS as well for accurate locations. And again, this is some training because GPS also needs for the person to be able to get, especially if it's surveying applications or boundary disputes, possible accurate locations. Field sampling of attributes. There's also need to be a field sampling and collect information and then ground through that information with what is actually captured. And if you are using aerial photo photography, to be able to extrapolate that to what you come to the sample here. For example, if you do analysis of trees and you pick up particular disease on the tree and you ground through that frequency, the particular um, frequency, you would want to extrapolate that frequency to other trees to see if that, that occurs or that particular water sample. And then you'll go and go through that. And within acceptable parameters, you can now say this frequency associated with this sample can now be found in these other areas. And then use remote sensing and aerial photography from satellites, from aerial photography or drones. Right? So for example, this morning or tomorrow, all it on today, you could fly a drone and see all the areas that have been flooded. And over the next five years, we'll go over the five days, we'll go to a four point or where the water accumulated and start clearing those channels. So data can be extracted from different things. So if you have a map, you could take all the rivers, the roads, the lakes, the states, and the capitals. That's so everything is on one map, like a scan map, but you can now extract it to different areas. Spatial analysis is asking questions and getting information out of it, and it turn that data into information. If you ask a question from the query builder, so capital, it could show up interactively on the map as well. Maps and databases are interactive in this regard. Questions are depicted visually on the fly. You can also link databases together by using 
um, links either to a network or cloud base and get information from other sources as well. GIS can be used in different ways, um, emergency services, fire and police, environmental monitoring and modeling, business site location, industry, government, education, research, and training, wherever there is data, spatial data analysis is needed. You can also do network analysis for shortest route or to intercept um, would be bandits or to put um, roadblocks and so forth. Ecosystem management is also important with the incorporation of pictures to depict what you are seeing on the ground. You could also do um, 3D mine with data well by using your seismic um, data to um, map out wellheads and depth of groundwater. You can map toxic fume and plume for um, industrial fires and dump site fires to see where the affected area based on wind direction and speed. And you can combine various display methods to, to bring your point out. You can show uh, maps, the data, and different fire and um, bar charts. You can also do oil spill and contamination to look at ocean current drift and affected populations and deploy mitigation strategies for, for um, any land impact. And you can also look at um, site location and client database. Right, site location, for example, if you want to map, as we have seen, the news um, um, pandemic um, infections and so forth. And then you can model future trends. Modeling is something important that you could anticipate what if scenarios and so forth. And then we can look at clusters for comparison of different maps. This is different scenarios. And then model for it. So if it occurs, you know what a standard response would be like. And this is just one example that I just um, put together because of the rains during night. Flash flood has a mapping using satellite imagery and GIS tools. So flash flooding in cities lead to high levels of water in the streets, as you know, and roads causing many problems such as bridge collapse, building damage, traffic problems. It is impossible to avoid the risk of floods or prevent the occurrence. However, it is plausible to work on the reduction of the effects and reduce the loss which they may occur. Flash flooding mapping is to identify sites in high risk flood zones is one of the most powerful tools for this purpose. Mapping flash flooding will be beneficial to urban and infrastructure planners, risk management, disaster response, or emergency services during extreme and intense rainfalls. Right, so these are some of the um, stuff that we um, look at when we are mapping um, flood runoff, soil influences, service slope, service roughness drainage, density, distance, main channel and land cover. And the reason I highlight this is because these are some of the data we need to collect in order to put into the database in order to run a flood model analysis to be able to come up with scenarios, look at vulnerable areas and deploy mitigation strategies. The sequence of operations can be summarized as follows, georeferencing, calculating elevations, calculating service slope, calculating the drainage, extracting main channel, preparing model file, and integration of all data into GIS. Most of this require um, a hydrologist to look at that and also somebody to interpret the, the satellite imagery and bring it into data. A flood, a, a flood model will look like something like this. So you'll have, this is a model that anybody could that using a GIS to get the information, put it into this model, and then do a manipulation of your weight for different things. So if, for example, if this weight is a higher weight, then you will have a different scenario here. And you can model your flood and mitigation strategies in order to what to change in your environment to reduce the impact of a flood. Thank you very much. That, that brings me to the end of the, the presentation. Uh, I try to touch on all aspects and give a perspective of what took place, what takes place with technology without going into too much of the details of the individual technologies because it's a lot and um, it's an overview. So uh, any other, any other um, queries, I will answer them in the questions with regard to any of the particular technologies. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Balio Singh. Thank you so much. And you, you gave a very comprehensive presentation. And I took note of, of a statement that you, you put up there. What is where? Why is it there? Why do I care? And that is something I will always remember, you know, those, those, because we, we often kind of, we, we don't connect the dots in terms of when we see the strategies on the ground, the technology that is used to gather the data, the crunching of the data to be able to give us the information that we need to employ the strategies. Very in-depth review, the connection between the data and the actual implementation of the mitigation strategies. If we never thought about it before, we were brought into that place this morning of being able to think about it. So I thank you very much for that presentation. I'm not yeah. seeing any questions at this time, but what I want to let you know is if there are questions that come in, I am going to address them at the appropriate time when we have the question and answer section a little later on. So again, thank you very much, sir, for your presentation. Thank you very much. As we progress in the event this morning, this webinar, I want to take this opportunity to thank all the persons who have logged in via the Facebook page, via YouTube, who are out there gaining the information. And please share the information gained. Feel free to ask questions. And also I would take the opportunity at this time to speak about the programs again that we have offering at the Cipriani Labor College in the form of the Certificate in Emergency Management. It's a one-year part-time certificate program in emergency management for persons who have completed the introductory course in crisis and emergency management or individuals who have experience in the field but are not yet certified. This program is designed for you. For persons who are seeking a bit more in expansion may have completed a certificate and who also may have experience in the field at a senior or mid-level wanting to get some information in emergency management. There is a diploma, which is a one-year part-time diploma that is offered in emergency management. It's open to persons who hold the certificate, as I said, and also persons who are practitioners in the field. So feel free to contact the college via the website to be able to get some more information and to register for this program. At this time, I want to welcome another presenter who is no stranger to us again, also an adjunct lecturer at the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, Mr. Earl Horn, holds the position of a fire officer within the Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service. He has been a member of the service for the past 14 years and is currently attached to the fire service as a training academy, as a training instructor. In addition, he is serving as an adjunct lecturer, as I would have mentioned, in the department at Cipriani titled Security Administration and Management and Emergency Management. He has uh, a lecturing career that started in 2013 with the 10 Saturday program. I would have mentioned the 10 Saturday program as being offered from time to time in emergency management. In 2019, he graduated from the University of the Southern Caribbean with an MSc in National Security and Intelligence Studies. And he is now a lecturer in the primary courses at the Cipriani Labor College. What is interesting about Mr. Horn is that he represents the college in that he himself started not only as a student of the college, but he started with the certificate level in emergency management. He also pursued the diploma in emergency management, the associate degree, and the bachelor's degree. So Mr. Horn is a representation that the college can take you right to where you want to go. And after pursuing the bachelor's degree in the security administration and management, he went on to pursue his master's degree at the University of the Southern Caribbean, 
of which he is a graduate. So I salute you, sir, for your perseverance in academia. Truly, you are a representation of what we want to see coming out of the college. The topic that Mr. Horn will speak on this morning will be the phases of emergency management. Welcome, Mr. Horn, and over to you. Thank you very much, Mom. I appreciate that glowing tribute. Allow me to share my slides so that we can begin. Pleasant evening, everyone. As indicated before, I am Earl Horn. My humble task today is to share some information about the phases of emergency management. At the end of this session, participants would be able to list the phases of emergency management, define each phase, and develop a comprehensive emergency management model for your home, your organization, and contribute to developing a model for your community. The information we will review today was taken from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the City of St. Louis Emergency Management Agency, Berra County's Emergency Management Agency, and Yale University. The comprehensive emergency management model on which the emergency management is based defines five phases of emergency management. Mitigation, preparedness, response, recovery, and business continuity. If you do simple research in this particular department, you will see different types of models. Any model you can take and apply it to your home, your business, or even your community. We will focus on five phases. We can use the Yale model, which has continuity to the core of mitigation response, recovery, and preparedness. Or we can develop our model into mitigation, preparedness, response, recovery, and business continuity, which shows a cyclical approach. The first phase we're gonna look at is mitigation. As Ms. Samaru would have identified in a prior presentation, in mitigation, there's structural mitigation and non-structural mitigation, and we'll get into that. But when you think about mitigation, think about taking sustained actions to reduce or eliminate long-term risk to people, property, from whether it be a crisis, an emergency, or a disaster situation. To accomplish mitigation, firstly, we must do a hazard analysis. The hazard analysis will identify what events can take place in or around the community. I know this is con not confined to the community because we could bring it to the home and the organization or business. So we have to understand what can happen. When we understand what can happen, what is the likelihood of that particular event or these events occurring? And what are the consequences of that particular event? The goals of mitigation are firstly, saving lives, protecting property secondly, and conserving the environment. Mitigation will reduce the cost to of responding to and recovering from all hazards. Because once mitigation is done to reduce the impact, the cost to respond to that particular, particular event or to recover from it will be significantly less because we are reducing the impact. Mitigation is considered the initial phase or the first phase in emergency management. And these measures should con be considered before disasters or emergencies to take place. Mitigation should be continuous action, which are integrated into 
all phases of emergency management. So even though mitigation is the first phase, it should be incorporated into preparedness, the way we respond, the way we recover from, and the way we institute business continuity measures. So I indicated that there are structural and non-structural mitigation. So let us look at examples of mitigation. We can think about a fire. We could think about there are a lot of flooding today. So there are a lot of rain today, sorry. So there's flooding. So to mitigate against fire, structural mitigation, when constructing our homes, we should consult with the fire service to give us advice on fire resistant materials that could be used to retard fires. So fire resistant doors could be used. The placement of smoke detectors in our homes, the placement of fire extinguishers and the different types of fire extinguishers that could be used. This is the type of information that the fire service could give to us to help in mitigation of a fire situation. Also, in the bushfire season, there are fire wardens that could come to your home and give advice. You can also consider the clearing of bush and debris from around the home. This forms part of mitigating bush fire. Flooding. Mitigation could include the clearing of drains to reduce the impact or the likelihood of the water rising and flooding out our homes. Getting sandbags if we are living in a flood prone area is for, forms part of mitigation. But mitigation could go on even to the responsibility of our representatives. They can institute zoning requirements to prevent persons from building in flood prone areas from building on river banks that will eventually flood. Those all form part of structural mitigation. Non-structural mitigation is very simple. We can just simply buy fire insurance, flood insurance. How does that reduce the impact? The insurance will now absorb some of that risk and will be able to put you in a position to recover from or rebuild your home quickly. So this is what mitigation is really about. The second phase we're gonna look at is preparedness. Preparedness is, is done because it is impossible to mitigate against all hazards. So we prepare for those things that we cannot prevent. Preparedness involves building of the emergency management function to respond efficiently and effectively to the hazards and to recover from the hazards. Preparedness is focused on the development of emergency response plans. And we will come back to that. And the capability for effective disaster response. Preparedness includes plans to save lives and facilitate response and recovery operations. Before we go further into preparedness, a very sad event took place in the last couple of days. So we can look to see how the phases of emergency management could be used so that we can learn from that incident in Marvel and we can be in a better position to protect ourselves and our families. So we spoke about placement of extinguishers, fire, smoke detectors in the home to mitigate fires. How do we prepare for fires? It's simple, we must develop a response plan. There is an acronym, EDIT, evacuation drills in the home. This is very important as part of preparedness so that all members of our household will have a clear idea of this plan on how to evacuate. Another part of mitigation could be having a fire escape in our homes, which give us an additional exit because we are all concerned about crime. So we have a lot of burglar proofs and that kind of stuff in our homes to 
protect us against the criminal element, but we should not give up safety for security. So there must be a balance. So we're gonna put fire escapes in our homes and part of our preparedness phase is to develop our evacuation plan and ensure that all members of the family understands this plan and this plan is carried out periodically. So preparedness involves all players or all persons who have a role to play at the local and state level in Trinidad and Tobago. We don't have a federal level of government here. So at the local government level, the regional corporation is that body responsible for helping persons within the community to be prepared for any event that could happen in your community. At the state level, we look at agencies like the fire service, ODPM, and other members of national security. So preparedness measures includes development of emergency operation plan or incident action plan. These plans are used to address hazards, risks, and response measures that would have been identified. So we identify the hazards, the risk of those hazards, and the response measures that we will take in the event that this particular event occurs. Preparedness is also about recruiting persons, assigning training staff and members of the community who can assist in key areas of response operations. So Mr. Samuel spoke, spoke about CERT, Community Emergency Response Teams. These, those persons, we have to get them properly trained and ready to respond as part of preparedness in our community. And within the last month or so, the local government agencies did run a CERT program, <clears throat> excuse me, they run a cert program that gave that type of training to persons throughout Trinidad. So that is a good start, but that needs to be continued so that we will be in a better state, a better preparedness state to respond to any type of event in our communities or our homes. So in preparedness, in our homes, in our organizations, we must identify the resources and supplies that we need in the event of a disaster. So the resources will form part of human and physical resources. Who are those persons who are trained? And what is the type of equipment that they need to respond? This forms part of our preparedness. Designing facilities for emergency use and conducting exercises. When we talk about exercises, most persons will be familiar with drill. A drill is a specific type of exercise. There are different types of exercises that you can use in your home. Going from the simplest to the most complex. Orientation exercises, just to get familiar with what needs to be done. Tabletop exercises, stress-free exercises that allows persons to think about their rules. Drills, that type of exercise that tests only one portion of the response plan. And that is sufficient for the home. Within the organization and the community, we could go further into the functional exercises and the full scale exercises. So after we have instituted mitigation measures and we are prepared, to, if the event occurs, we must know respond. But what is response? Immediate action taken to, to react to a disaster. It involves emergency operations, primarily to save lives and then secondary to protect property. And we also go into environmental conservation. This is accomplished by taking action to eliminate the threat or reduce it to an acceptable level because we may not be able to remove all threats similar to flooding. You can't totally eliminate flooding. So we reduce it to an acceptable level. Our response activities may occur during, before, during, or after a disaster begins. Before, when we talk about response, we can think about 
slow onset disaster. Slow onset disaster is a disaster that we can track, similar to a hurricane. We can track a hurricane, know where the hurricane is going to make landfall and when that hurricane is going to make that landfall. So we can move resources closer to where it will be needed. And this form part of, part of response before. During, of course, when the hurricane is battering the land, emergency crews may be required to go out to help evacuate persons, save lives. And then after, after the hurricane has passed, then we can continue response and go into recovery operations. So keeping with the example that we are using throughout the trail of a fire, a house fire, you understand what mitigation is, how they prepare, but response. The response to this fire, because we have put smoke detectors, have our extinguishers, preparedness, we train to use the extinguishers, how to use it properly, when to use it. To respond now is when the fire is in its incipient stage or very small, they can take that extinguisher and quickly use it to extinguish that fire, to prevent it, eliminate it. So response activities include, and we spoke about edit, evacuation drills in the home. Evacuation forms an important part of a response plan in your home. Providing food, water, shelter, medical care. When we expand into response based on the community level or the national level, those are some of the activities that will have to take place. Search and rescue operations. The Trinity Tobago Fire Service is suitably trained and equipped with the Land Search and Rescue Unit who is located up at Santa Cruz Fire Station and persons located throughout Trinidad and Tobago who are trained to respond, they are the ones that will initiate that search and rescue operation. Search members can do search and rescue, but it must be light search and rescue in buildings that are not significantly damaged. If that happens, then that response component must be for the formal responders. Restoring critical infrastructure is a very important part of response. To get your infrastructure up and running, communication, lights, water, you need those things working during a disaster. Providing safety and security for members of the community. Now the Trent Tobago Police Service and the Defense Force has a critical role to play during the disasters for this particular reason. Because members of the community who are asked to evacuate, for example, may not want to evacuate unless they know or they are assured that their homes will be secured. So the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and the Defense Force will be out to provide that type of safety and security for members of the community as part of the response phase. And then we move into recovery. Recovery consists of those activities beyond or after the emergency period to restore the community's functions and to manage reconstruction. Rebuilding communities so that individuals, businesses, and governments can function on their own is a critical part of recovery. The goal of recovery is to return a community or the country to a state of normalcy and protect against future hazards. Recovery is very important. And when you think about the term recovery, to describe recovery to anyone in simple language is just basically to tell them, returning that state, that community to a state of normalcy, returning your home to a state of normalcy, returning your workplace to a state of normalcy. This is what recovery is about. So we talk about structural and non-structural mitigation. The non-structural mitigation, simply buying insurance, fire insurance, flood insurance for your home. As part of recovery, you can now access that funds to return your home to a state of normalcy. And these activities take place right after the emergency. 
So recovery may be short term and long term because we wouldn't be able to recover from everything immediately. So in the short term, what we must focus on is the restoration of utilities, getting back your lights, your water, your communication systems, have that up and running, reopening roads and schools. And reopening roads may include building Bailey bridges, temporary bridges, because reopening roads may form part of your long-term recovery if significant damage was done. Crisis counseling for victims and responders. This is a very important point to look at. When we think about affected persons in a disaster or emergency situation, we think only about the victims. But the persons who are responding to are exposed to the same psychological trauma as the persons who are in the community. So it is important that the persons in the community are taken care of by the responders, but there must be a mechanism in place to take care of the responders psychologically. Short-term recovery could be given of grants for individuals and families for temporary housing and repair of their housing and medical and funeral expenses form parts of, of our short-term recovery, returning the community to a state of normalcy. And then there's long-term recovery, which is referred to as stabilizing all of the systems. This can take years. So it includes restoring economic activity and rebuilding communities, facilities, and housing. When we look at the situation that we are in now with the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, recovery in terms of restoring our economic activity is not going to happen overnight. This is why it is simply placed into long-term recovery so that we know it's going to take a period of time to recover. But a house fire should form part of short-term recovery because you want to get back into your homes. You want to try to get back life as normal as possible. So it's important to follow these stages of emergency management. And we must rebuild and strengthen damage infrastructure. In emergency management, there is the same, and I heard Captain Wynn mention it earlier, build back better. This must be the goal for recovery operation. We must not build back in the same way. If we build back in the same manner, then the same type of disaster will cause the same level of impact. And this is what we want to prevent. So we build back better, we build back stronger, so that when the event happens again, the impact will be significantly less. And lastly, we look at business continuity. Business continuity is the process of instituting or putting measures in place for businesses to protect their critical function during and after a disaster. It gives the business the ability to continue their regular servicing of various communities. And of course, when we talk about business continuity, we are referring to utility services also. So I'd like to use the example given by Mrs. Hamaru but as a simple example of how we can think about business, uh, business continuity, excuse me. Quartz mega store on fire. Persons who have stuff there on higher purchase believe, hey, I got away. I don't have to pay anymore. But because courts have a business, continu business continuity strategy where they are not keeping all their data in one location, they could simply say to persons, just go to a different location and you can pay there. But business continuity, in another focus, we can look at the critical infrastructure of our country. So like the oil and gas industry, we must have business continuity measures there to protect against man-made disasters, specifically terrorism. Because if the terrorists really want to cripple our economy, they attack the sector that gives us the most GDP. 
So those oil and gas companies must have measures in place to ensure that if their business is attacked, they can simply run the process, maybe on a lower level, from somewhere else. And I was doing some reading last night and I saw that um, down at Point Lease as the desalination plant has been closed, was put out that for maintenance, the closer maintenance. But there I was thinking about what was the business continuity plan for, for that uh, desalination plant. Because a plan should be in place to ensure when there is maintenance activity taking place that it should not disrupt the core function of that desalination plant, which is to give water to Wasser so that it can be given to the citizens of our country. So that is a measure that needs to be looked at to prevent those things from happening. So business continuity would be the last phase of emergency management. You can build your model to put business continuity as a separate cycle, or it can be the core or the center of all phases, mitigation, preparedness response, and recovery. So looking back, a successful emergency management policy for your home, your business, the community, for our country, must include activities from all phases of emergency management. So simply having a plan for your home, a successful emergency management plan for your home, you simply have to follow the model and institute all the measures at the different stages. And you have a comprehensive plan for your home. The tail planning and execution is required. So it should not be done in a manner where we are not taking it serious. It must be detailed. And the phases of emergency management often overlap. So don't get too confused if you think response is strained into recovery or mitigation is strained into preparedness because there's often no clear defined boundaries where one phase ends and the other begins. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Horn. You have indeed expressed very eloquently the, the facets of emergency management and those phases. And I want to, I have a question. I have a question for you, but um, I will ask you that at the end. There are some <laughs> questions that came in um, regarding uh, the presenters that went before us, right? So I would start with those. Yes, so to Colonel Williams, the question that came in, are there any disasters you know of where social media was used effectively? So Colonel Williams, the person wants to know if there are any disasters that you know of personally where social media was used effectively. To Mr. Baldio Singh. The question to you, has GIS been used in assisting in areas where there is severe flooding in Trinidad and Tobago? So Mr. Baldio Singh and Mr. Williams. Um, good day. Um, flooding aspects in Trinidad, although models have been made, um, it has not been used effectively in the past. Um, conceptual models and plans were drawn up, but they were not executed um, to any extent to impact any flooding events. Um, for example, as I was pointing out in my lecture, um, people went out and bought drones and GPS devices, but to fit into a model to effectively work in that scenario, it was not applied. And that's why I, I em emphasize in my, in my lecture in my presentation that you need to have a comprehensive plan before you go out and buy expensive mm -hmm. equipment. Yeah. Because by the time you buy, you come up with a plan, um, because of the rapid pace of technology, the equipment becomes ineffective and obsolete. Mm -hmm. And therefore the flood models must be built first and then you look at what you want to, 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 to achieve. 
For example, if you want to build a house, you just need to build a or act like you want a house. You just want three bedrooms, a kitchen, so forth and so on, and plan plan what you want to do. So it has not been used effectively. Technocrats know um, what has to be done, but in terms of ex um, executing any plan, that has not been done. Okay, thank you very much for that. And that is a perfect example of saying we can't put the cart before the horse because we sometimes go out, as you say, and get stuff and then seek to plan for. And then when we put the plan on the table, it's all outdated and we have wasted thousands, sometimes millions of dollars. Thank you very much for answering that question, Mr. Balio Singh. So I'd go back to Mr. Horn at this time and um, you used a term there and, and Captain Wint would have used it. And I just want to highlight it for the listeners. Build back better, the three Bs. And often in our society, when we hear of a disaster, we try to, we try to, to put things together for the individuals to survive. And oftentimes we put together that survival response and it is not better. In fact, it's supposed to be temporary, but as we say in our jargon, it becomes temporary permanent. And I'm sure my colleagues here can adhere to that. And it happens across all sectors. So that build back better that both you and Captain Wint highlighted is very, very important when thinking of that recovery, that recovery phase. What I like about your presentation too is that you brought in the everyday scenarios and it would have encompassed a bit of what we have heard during the course of the morning, even from, you know, from Ms. Samaru and from Captain Wint. Uh, I see Colonel Williams is on. Colonel Williams, there was a question to you and it speaks to the use of social media effectively in recent times in a disaster. So have you... You know any information well, on that? Where social media sure, sure. I mean, uh, you know, well, I, I hope that people caught on based on the fact that social media is, is in fact mass media that that it could be applied in all phases. It could be, it be applied to educate in, in the in the prevent well the sensitization the and the and mitigation and, and making people aware and so on as well as in response and 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 even in recovery again sharing information ensuring that people in fact don't just try to go back to where they were, but in fact, going back to better than they were, which is the, the emphasis on build back better. But um, in, 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 uh, in terms of, let's take Haiti for instance, the recent experience in Haiti, right? Um, as, we, as, we, uh, as we saw, um, the, 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 the minute it happened, right? Um, even before traditional media got to the scene, right? Our social media was able to tell us and to show us what has ha what has happened, and that's it. And that's the, that's both a good thing, and that's what that's that's what we call the pros of social media. It makes us immediately aware, but it also it's also um, there's also a negative side to that because. Um, in terms of ensuring that the, the a correct appreciation of, of what is, is seen, of, of, of what is being shared, a correct appreciation of that, um, that concern is not always about that. So, so, so that um, it, when, 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 when the wrong message or a misleading message gets out there, because of social media, then, mm -hmm. then the authorities, are, and when I say the authorities, I, I, I'm referring as, I, I'm, I'm particularly focused on the emergency management, right? Authorities now have um, to now combat that. They now have to, to, to be concerned about correcting the images or correcting the information, you know, so, so that um, there, is, there is that side of it as well. Um, but, but if we see social media and if you, you know, as, as mass media, um, there is that, of course, we know that, um, let's take the, 
let's go back to what I would call traditional media as opposed to social, which is social media, which is like new media. The traditional media in the newspapers, you have your editor. Your editor provides a measure of, of control over what's printed. And the broadcast houses, you also have editor uh, information or news editors, and they also exercise a level of control into what's, what, what is shared. Now, that doesn't happen in social media. So that mm -hmm. on, the, on the one hand, it, with, with traditional media, because traditional media is able to exercise that degree of control, that's where we get the trust that that's, that, that enables us to build trust over time, right? But with social media, you don't know who put in what, or, or, or you don't know the bona fides of who's putting what. So anybody with an opinion could put out on social media. And if we are not, if we are not aware of that particular characteristic of social media, we may, there are those of us who might be inclined to A, believe everything we hear on radio or believe everything we read in the newspaper and by, and, and by extension, believe everything we see on social media. Of course, that's a very dangerous place to be. So, so, so that um, while we value the, the, um, the benefits that social, me to social media brings us um, in emergency management, making us instantaneously aware, making everybody, um, you know, not only the ability to, to, um, to get the word out, but, um, well, I, I, you can also get the word in through, through, through social media. But, um, you know, we, we have to be aware that unlike traditional media, the level of controls the level of accountability, um, that's not, it doesn't, um, it doesn't exist in the same way. That level of accountability does not exist in the same way. And therefore, as a tool, we have to be careful of how social media is used, whether we as, 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 um, as, as the disaster management, emergency management community, how we use it, but, but we also have to be aware of how other people use use um, social media, so I, I I don't know if I've been able to address the issue that you raised in the question. Yes, um, and and you made some very salient points. The information that we receive via social media is just that information via social media. It can either be negative or positive, accurate or inaccurate, but when it goes out there. There's no way of controlling how that information is manipulated. And we've seen a lot of that even in this time of the global pandemic. There is so much information out there yep. that it tends to confuse persons and it can make a situation much worse. Worse, that's right. Than it, you know, it, it can exacerbate a disaster bring that information out there. And Captain Wind would have mentioned something that relates to what you said. He said, educate yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, educate yourself. So though we have social media and, and we have, yes, go ahead. No, I remember, go ahead, go ahead. I, as you said, that our own experience in Trinidad and Tobago just came to mind. Um, there was a time at the, at the ODPM, where we had the ability to monitor social media, monitor what people were saying about the ODPM, what people were saying about um, hazard events and so on in Trinidad. And because we had that facility to monitor what we were able to do, and when I say we, I, I simply include myself, but it's not, I, I wasn't the one who instituted it, but it was there, right? And I'm part of that community. Um, we were able at, at, at the state level to, to a, hear what people, hear people's concerns, right? Share those concerns with the appropriate response agency, right? But it also gave us the ability, we as, as ODPM, the ability to, to check back, to make sure that the, that the issue was addressed. So, so we had that that control, well, 
that that feedback or that that monitoring capability. So it it was no during that time it was no longer possible for a citizen to make a complaint or make some kind of um, request of the disaster management system and, 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 and not get a response, but not hear from anybody, right? Um, at, at the level of the ODPM, we were able to check back and say, you know, Mr. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, have you had a response? So, so that kept everybody honest. There was a time when we lost that ability, right? And, and, and I'm saying that ability is, is really a social media ability. That capability was a social media capability. And we lost that for a while. And, and again, once we lost that, it, 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 it created that opportunity again for, for affected citizens to try to contact the authorities and sometimes the authorities don't know at least the odpm as the, as the national disaster office not not being a, in, in a position to ensure that the system gives the citizen the service that it deserves so that's 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 another critical importance of of a critical role that social media the social media tools allow us in emergency management to use. And I wanted that, I wanted people to understand that as well. Thank you very much. I, I recall a time receiving text messages from the ODPM. They were messages that would come if, if there was a change in the threat level for the weather, et cetera, et cetera. But I have not seen any of those in recent times. Is this related to the, that ability you spoke about to respond to, is that connected in any way? No, no, um, because threat levels, especially as it refers to the, the hydrometeorological hazards, in other words, things coming from the Met Office. The Met Office is, is our expert, right? So the Met, they do their thing, they pass it to, the ODPM. So, so whatever threat level the the the, the met indicates to the to the ODPM, that's what the ODPM will share to the general public. Um, the ODPM will not take it upon its own to change a threat level. It will always refer back to the 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 met service because the met service is considered the subject matter expert. So, if, if you don't see um, a change is probably because the, the ODPM was not notified by the Met Service that the threat level has changed. Right, okay. Okay? okay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Uh, to Captain Wint, we're coming back to you, right where we started. There's a question for you. What is Sedema's involvement in emergency management in the Caribbean? Uh, thank you for the question. The Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency is the coordinating body for the 19 member states that are presently within the CDM arrangement. They are responsible for the management of the Comprehensive Disaster Management framework of the region. They are also responsible for coordinating the four focal points and response to hazard impacts across the region. So basically, they are the champion for disaster risk reduction and risk management for the region and the coordination of responses. They set the framework and work with the respective, we call them uh, participating states or the national disaster offices to ensure that their programs are all aligned in one, they all speak and write on the same page. And when there are uh, hazard impact, that coordination soliciting of funds, managing of the disaster process uh, along all those guiding principles are maintained. So just as the United Nations might deal with security issues from the Security Council, the CDEMA response framework sets the, the parameters to which member states can be engaged based on bilateral agreements with prime ministers, or within the framework to respond to incident. And all nations, including Trinidad and Tobago, are participants and will be recipient of 
any coordinated response that is required. Uh, the population might have seen trying to be responding to a series of events, both at the national, now you can see at a personal level, it may be deployed to almost six, well, every major incident in the last eight years. Um, so it happens. And therefore, even Trinidad Tobago, and I'll ask persons to recall Hurricane Ivan in Grenada, Trinidad Tobago, as a focal point, is responsible for responses to Grenada, Guyana, and Suriname. So when Ivan was going to Grenada, we were able to put boots on the ground even before, based on that agreement signed by all prime ministers at that point in time to allow member states such as Trinidad Tobago to respond to the city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Captain Wint. Right, so I have a question for Julie. Julie, there's a question for you uh, in, in terms of your speaking about suit. If a professional wants to volunteer, what is the process put in place? And by a professional, I mean the person is already qualified or certified in emergency response. So the CERT training would be something that they would have covered in their own professional realm of study. How is this process, you know, done? How, is it available for persons to volunteer for a CERT team or within their communities? Is that process available? I'm almost sure it is because remember uh, the regional corporation and as we mentioned before, the disaster management units would have a listing of all the CERTs in their area. And it means that depending on the area that you live, you can in fact go to the regional corporation, the DMU, the disaster management unit, and get in touch with the coordinator. And then they would in fact advise you in terms of what is best. Because if you have done the training already, it means that you already know what it's all about. So volunteering, it would mean that now they would look to see how they can absorb you into the CERT team in your particular area. Okay, thank you very much. Because I know there are people that are looking on that are thinking, how do I volunteer if I already have the training? So that was good information for them. So we're going back to Mr. Horn. Mr. Horn, as a firefighter, what phases um, is the... fire service most involved in, in terms of those events. Madam, please um, repeat your question because it My was apologies. not received in its entirety. Right. The question posed was, as a fire officer, could you say what phases the fire service is most involved in, in terms of the phases you would have outlined? Thank you for your question. The fire service and to answer this, I'll have to answer it in two ways. Because they ask what, which phases we are most involved in. Yeah. But the fire service as the number one response agency in this country to crisis, emergency, and disasters would be engaged in all phases. Well, the four major phases without business continuity. But we are most notably in the response phase. Why? The fire service is the only organization that has the persons, the trained persons, and the equipment to respond to all types of disasters. So the fire service will be most engaged in response. However, the fire service must be engaged in mitigation and preparedness as well. How is this done? The fire service through the fire prevention section and the various the stations will go into the community and offer advice through training on how to mitigate against fire and other related emergencies. Because the fire service is not only responsible for fires, because section 3A of the fire service are clearly defined that the fire service is related, responsible for fire and other emergencies. So it's not just the fires only. So at the mitigation stage, the fire service should receive your house plans once it's approved so that they can make recommendations on where to put the extinguishers, where to put 
the smoke detectors to ensure that you have good fire detection. And if it's commercial businesses, the fire suppression aspect of it. So that is the mitigation component. The preparedness component, when organizations have in their fire drills as part of the response plans to be prepared on how to evacuate, the fire service will accompany that particular organization during that time to offer advice on how fast it should happen, what is the best way to do it and ensure it happens in an orderly manner. Now to recovery. After the response phase has gone and it's time to recover, for example, flooding. Let us look at Digo Martin. Digo Martin floods a lot. The fire service will re-enter the community to assist persons to clean up their homes in terms of getting mud and slush out of their homes and their driveway and that kind of thing as part of returning that community to a state of normalcy. So the fire service will be present in mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery operations. Commercial businesses who need advice on business continuity can also check the fire service, but we are most present for mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery operations. Thank you very much for that. Uh, just an additional question coming from myself. Uh, is the fire prevention unit or any unit within the service engaged in public education. I know now it's the COVID time, but is that a practice within the organization to engage in much public education? And if the organization does, how does one get the fire service to come to their organization, school establishment, etc., to you know address that? The fire service is engaged in that type of activity throughout the year. However, for the fire prevention week, which is in October of each year, there is an amplified effort to dealing with that. So it happens throughout on a smaller scale, but for fire prevention week, it is amplified. You'll see it a, little, a lot more and you can deal with that. The second aspect for persons who wish to get the fire service to come and do that type of training, just simply write to the chief officer requesting that type of training. The chief officer will then forward that information to the relevant fire prevention section or training department if necessary. Okay. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive response. So I, I think our viewers are quite informed as to the processes whereas emergency management is concerned, whether it be volunteering, getting certified, understanding the function or functions of the, the fire service, the GIS systems, actually understanding media and where media fits in. And of course, speaking to the preparation and the prevention of disasters within our community. We don't have any other questions at this time. So before we close, I have one question for Mr. Horn. I spoke on your CV as being a student, a former student of the Cipriani Labor College. And it is, it is our honor to see one of our students, you know, excel and, and attain the levels which you have attained. So for our listening audience, I would like to ask you, what was your driving force in the continuation of your studies? Because the fact that you started from the certificate level, it's really impressive to me. And I made reference to it in speaking to a young man about pursuing studies at Cipriani. So I just wanted to share for the benefit of our listeners, what was your driving force to you know, go through those levels from the certificate straight to the bachelor's? Thank you very much for your question, ma'am. I started Cipriani in 2009 after being advised by presently acting fast officer Dolly to pursue the emergency management certificate. He is a former classmate of Mrs. Samuel. So as a fire officer, he indicated that it is important for us to understand that type of information because it will help in our scope of work. So I started off with certificate and diploma in emergency management as purely a way to become a better fire officer. 
to expand my horizon and my information in this particular field to help my organization, as as you should see. Young and just want to do things, so I did that. After completing the diploma, throughout the two years, I was under the guidance of the late Mr. John Sylvester, who I must give credit to for me continuing this drive. And he told me throughout that time, Earl, do not stop. Education is the only thing that will help you throughout. The fire service is there, but what happens if the fire service is no longer there? If something happens and you are no longer a member. So he was the head of department for emergency management and security at the time. So I decided because he was guiding me and as a former police officer and fire officer himself, I could have listened to him because he had the experience that I was now going through. And as a holder of four different master's degrees and was pursuing his PhD at the time, that kind of encouraged me to strive to be like him because he was a fire, sub a fire station officer, a fire substation officer when he left the organization to pursue education. And I went into the security field because sadly there was no degree in emergency management to continue in that light. And I took the challenge to study security, which was very strange for a fire officer to decide to study security. But I actually enjoyed learning that different dynamic and seeing how security could be applied to the fire service because safety and security have a role to play with each other. So I continued in the security administration and management onto the bachelor's degree because I started seeing what Mr. Sylvester was saying to me. In the early parts, I couldn't see it because I left school with just the basic requirement to get into the fire service, the O levels, and I did not see my way to having a, a degree. But Mr. Sylvester keep going over and over Early could do it. Then I met persons like Mrs. Samaru, Ms. Archer, and they keep encouraging me. Mrs. Samaru on the emergency management side, Ms. Archer on the security side. Because even I almost left the fire service to join the police service because of Ms. Archer. <laughs> so because I was so in love with studying security at the time. And after going through seven and a half years in Cipriani, being molded, trained to enjoy academia, seeing how it could help me in my career and how it could help me outside of my career because I have to plan for after I leave the fast service as well. A good friend of mine, um, Tamika, she found the master's degree in national security in the USC and she advised me that we should go and do it. And I went on to do that. And with the foundation that was given to me by Cipriani, believe it or not, people may think of Cipriani as less than, that foundation in Cipriani allowed me to excel at USC. And I'll give you an example. We were given a task of presenting for two and a half hours, the first semester in master's degree. And people were bewildered. How could this be possible? But every step of the way in Cipriani, I was trained to present. I was trained every time I present, I must dress well because you dress for the part. And those, the combination of those factors helped me to keep driving forward and seeing every stage I reach, I could reach the other stage and I could reach the other stage. And very uh, personal to me as the final driving force, which is the most important one, is to ensure that I made my mother proud. Because as her only child and growing up seeing her struggles to try to provide for me, I took the challenge to now provide for her. So a combination of Mr. Sylvester, Mrs. Samaru, Ms. Archer, my mom, Tabika, and of course, my research partner, secret partner, a lady by the name of Nicole Thomas. Every time I wrote something as Senator to read, Make sure and read that properly to help me out. They are the ones who drove me to where I am today. And hopefully I can make that final step to the last stage of education.
So thank you very much for your question, ma'am. I appreciate that. Yes, and it, it, your, your, your response is just the response I believe is necessary for motivating persons to be able to step forward, to move forward, because often persons doubt themselves. And when you spoke about, you know, being in the, the fire service and emergency response and then going into the security field, it was a bit of a shift. And I share similar, similar uh similar path with you because I started off in EMS, in emergency, in EMS many years ago when my shift came to so psych and criminology. That is another story for another day. So I, I understand your shift and the drive which you spoke about. We have another, another colleague on here and you mentioned her just now and I'll give her the opportunity to give a part of a testimonial before we close. Um, Ms. Samaru, can you share from your perspective also as a student at the Cipriani Labor College, your, your interactions and what would have been your driving force to continue to where you are today? Well, you know, I first have to say, Arlene, I am so proud of my former student that as much as I try to just let him call me Julie, because we are now with teachers, he still refers to me as yes, Miss, sorry. but <laughs> I guess I've been around him for so long that he just can't give up that title. But, you know, Arlene, when I listen to Earl and when I have to make my introduction in the class, when I started going to Cipriani, as I tell most people, and Captain Wint will relate to this because he and my husband went to Cipriani at the same time. Cipriani was one block. It did not have all of these um, floors and classrooms that we had. It was one block. And I did the first... 10 Saturday I did was introduction to industrial relations because I wanted to have an understanding of that. And then I moved on to do the associate degree in human resource management. And that was four years of study. And you are custom coming home at 10 o'clock every night for all of these years. And when I graduated, and started coming home at five o'clock in the afternoon, I just did not know what to do with myself. So a couple of friends and I, who I was the driver because they all lived in Arima, so I brought them up every day from school. I said, you know, guys, I, I can't take this coming home at five o'clock every afternoon. We gotta do something. So I went and enrolled in the 10 Saturday program. At that point in time, Earl Hernandez was the person who facilitated the 10 Saturdays. And I so enjoyed that course that I said, you know what, I'll continue. And I went on to do the certificate. And then I went on to do the associate degree. And just as Earl said, because that was the highest level, there was none offered in Trinidad, I looked outside. And that's where Neville and I used to collaborate because he went to the same Leicester University and pursued the same course. And again, I think we always, uh, Earl and myself and people in our era will always have to be mentioning Mr. Sylvester because he was the impetus for me then going into training. Because he said, Ms. Amaru, I want you to start doing the 10 Saturdays. I said, what? He said, yes, I want you to start doing it 10 Saturdays. And I just loved it. And the experiences that I've had with students, unfortunately, because of pandemic, now we can't get that. We went to several disaster management units to see how they operate. We went to Tobago. And then it moved on. The more qualifications I got, the more he put me in another area to teach. So then I went on to the certificate. And then I started teaching in the diploma. And as I mentioned in my bio, I think there are only two courses that I have not really taught in the whole program. And that would have been the one that Colin does in terms of technology and terrorism. And now that I've completed two masters and doing a PhD, and I see what I can bring back to Cipriani because so many students that we encourage. So if it's only up to the diploma 
don't stop there. Continue. Even if it means that you may have to switch, but continue. Continue your education. And in that way, I think this is where Earl and I are now giving back to where we started. And I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Thoroughly enjoying it. So, Aline, that's, that's me. I am here until Cipriani says you no longer need your services. And I will continue getting students like Earl, who even after they graduate will still be calling me Miss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And your, your reflection brought some reflection to me in terms of remembering, remembering Captain Wind when he actually, you know, was in that time at Cipriani. I remember, I remember that many, many years ago, Captain Wind. And even for myself, as you said, you know, doing the, the 10 Saturdays, my introduction to Cipriani, because I am also a student of Cipriani, past student, I did HR with Miss B. And so it was thoroughly enjoyable. I see Mr. Horn laughing because we all remember Miss B. You know, Miss B was just remarkable. And I said to myself at the time, wow, this, you know, what they consider a little college, you know, nobody really knows about Cipriani, but there's such fire in there. And then going on to encounter Mr. Sylvester, who did exactly what you said, uh, Ms. Samu. He told me, you could do this. You're teaching these courses. You're working in EMS long time. You could do this. And then he continued on and, you know, so we want to take a moment just to salute, you know, Mr. John Sylvester for his contribution to Cipriani Labor College and to all our lives, you know, would be all of us here, he would have contributed to our lives. So thank you very much for sharing. I want to take this opportunity to ask if any of our presenters would like to say anything before we close. Captain Wint, would you like to share? I would just like to support the sentiment because again, Mr. Sylvester was, um, Having the facilitator for the first four, was a member, and um, I will say that he has changed the lives and impressed upon a lot of us to, to pursue disaster management. Uh, for me, it has become uh, a center of my existence. Um, I normally tell my class my stories that I was born, and this will give away my age. Two weeks after the last hurricane that affected Trinidad and Tobago, and the United Nations has taken my birthday and declared it International Disaster Risk Reduction Day. <laughs> my part, I was destined for this. Uh, so in closing, I think um, my opening and the contribution of all the other presenters, a stage for individuals, communities, government entities, and, and business to pursue the tenants of disaster risk reduction from our all of government and all of community approach. And I hope that we, the college can continue along the path that it has set to this forum to educate and uplift members of the society to understand that um, disaster risk reduction, disaster management Enterprise risk management and our business continuity in there because enterprise takes business continuity and other things is critical to our very existence and the future of the next generations. So for me, I wish to thank those who have logged in. Thanks for your participation. Uh, to the college again, well done. Thanks for having myself along with the distinguished panel uh, for being here. So here ends my presentation. Thank you very much, Captain Wind. Colonel Williams, would you like to add before we close? Um, I would simply like to say thank you to uh, the, the college for both the honor and the pleasure uh, of sharing um, my thoughts on the issue of, of uh, the use of social media. I was happy to um, to share a little bit of my experience with you. I, I trust that I was able to live up to the expectation um, that, that would have emanated from the invitation. And I wish the 
college uh, to, uh, all the best uh, in in the future and that it, hope that it continues to produce the excellent uh, stu students or graduates that it already has thank you very much very much thank you very much Williams. i would like to take this opportunity to myself thank the distinguished panel for being a part of this event and making this event as informative and well-rounded as it was it just turns out that a lot of us are connected to cipriani from as they say from birth you know it was not a selection done by that criteria but it just turned out that way. And I want to thank you all for advancing the cause of emergency management and disaster preparedness management in Trinidad and Tobago and regionally. So we have regional representation amongst us. And I would all like to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us. To the organizers, I would also like to say thank you. And at this time, I would like to invite Ms. Julie Samaru to do our closing remarks. Ms. Samaru. Thank you, Arlene. Ladies and gentlemen, all over, on behalf of the head of the Security Administration, and Emergency Management Department, Ms. Adriana Archer. I'd like to thank you all first for spending time with us this morning. I'd also like to say special thanks to all the presenters, all of whom I know I coached to make sure that they please turn up for this event today. So I wanna thank Captain Wint, I know we he had late hours and I would send messages to him very late at night to remind him that he made a commitment. To Dave, I would have to touch base with him while he's on the Gulf course. And he says, Julie, I'm teeing off now. I said, yes, but please remember. Earl, well, we are already in a class together. So I am touching base with him every day. And Colin was my former teacher as well. So I said, but you know, we have really do have a good bunch of people here with us today. So I wanna thank them all. I hope they'll be available for another time. I will look forward to that. To all the persons behind the scene who helped us put this together. Antonio, I'm mentioning you as one of my former students. Thank you so much for all of the assistance. And to all who would have tuned in this morning, thank you for looking on. We thank you for your questions. And we do hope that we hear from you. I think um, Arlene has given you quite a lot of information about all the programs that we have offered. So without further ado, we are still people in the rainy season. There are disasters happening all over the world. And each one of you that hears us here today can make a personal difference please make that commitment. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks, Ms. Samaru. Thank you very much. And again, I would like to say thank you to everyone, our persons on Facebook and YouTube, our behind the scenes crew that has been keeping me abreast of what's happening. I want to thank you all for your dedication to this event and I look forward to us hosting more events like this in advancing emergency management in Trinidad and Tobago and by extension, the Caribbean. So thank you very much, everyone. Please do have a wonderful evening and stay safe, watch the three Ws. Thank you very much. <laughs>